Okay. Yes. I think it is. Good morning, if we're live. I'm not sure if we are. Um, no, Charles and uh, Laura Lee, and then Courtney's running about five minutes late. All right, just give us one second if we are live just to get together here. Okay. Um, so we've got some people upstairs in a different room. We're going to bring them down. So we'll just get started here in a second. So what happens when you train people to do something for long enough and you try to switch? <laughs> As human creatures, we are, we are creatures of habit. There is no lie on that. All right, uh, Susan, and uh, uh, if you could turn your camera on, and Dave, I just want to make sure everything's good, uh, and if you guys could do an audio check, too. All right, we can't hear anything. Uh, Susan, I saw you unmute yourself, but we can't hear you. Audio check. Yeah, we heard that. Thank you. Can you hear me? Sorry. We'll get there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Charlie, you in? I'm here. Do you need help getting in? No. So if you could log into your email and pull up the panelist link that Carol sent you on the computer. Can you do that? On the, if not, we, we'll get you in another way. Okay. I've got a message that says the host would like you to unmute. No. Tell the host no. no. <laughs> All right, let's see, uh, David and Susan, if you guys could just unmute yourself and try again to talk. I want to make sure that, that we can hear you. Hey, you hear me? Yep, we hear you, David. You're good. Susan, could you just All right, it's not like me to be quiet. <laughs> well, just want to make sure we can hear you. I see you're unmuted, Susan, but we still can't hear you. Can you hear me good? Logan, will you help? Charlie. We got Courtney and then David. Yes, so Courtney. So, yeah. Good morning, David. David, why don't you sit on this? Will you sit on this side? Just that way we've spaced out a little more. Right here. Right here. We still can't hear you, Susan, just letting you know.
Hey, David, if you could mute yourself, just letting you know you're unmuted. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> hey, I'm raising kids here. All right. Yes, Susan, we read you loud and clear. That was good. Thank you. I had to call it on my cell phone. I see you guys and hear you on my computer, but I'm not sure why it's not working. So, good morning. Well, I know why. It's Friday morning. That's why. So, uh, <laughs> all right. Well, we've got a good group here. So, uh, we'll go ahead and um, start the meeting here because we do have quorum. Just give me one second, and uh, everyone else is logging in. So thank you, um, everybody, for uh, for coming in. We have got a lot more than we thought, which which is a good thing. All right, so um, we'll go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, Carol, if you could do roll call. Yes, uh, Lorraine Koss. Here. Charles Venuto. Here. Vinny Toronto? Here. David Schur? Here. John Windsor? Here. David Lane? Laura Lee Thompson? Okay. Laura Lee Thompson? Here. Stephanie Ely? Here. Kimberly Newton? Courtney Barker? Here. Todd Swingle? Susan Hodgers? And Dennis Basile? Here. Okay, great. Thank you, Carol. Um, just a little bit reminder again um, for those in Zoom land, um, if you could uh, use the raise your hand button um, and I will identify you and here in the room, um, you can use the raise your hand button too. That will help me uh, keep track of, of, of the order. Um, so uh, if we could use the raise the hand button, that's great. If not and you're in the room, just throw something at me and I will call on you. Um, all right. So um, we'll go ahead and look for a motion to approve the agenda. Motion to approve. Uh, motion to approve. Okay, thank you, Lorraine. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, Stephanie seconded. Second. Oh, San Susan, thank you. Um, any discussion on the agenda? All right, uh, with that, let's go ahead and take a vote. All in favor of approval of the agenda, say aye. 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 Okay, I think we got it. Uh, all those opposed? All right, so the agenda passes. Um, also, um, because uh, Susan is a voting member and she's in Zoom land, uh, if we could do a motion to uh, allow those who are remote to vote, um, I'll look for that motion. I move that we allow. Motion to approve. Go ahead, Stephanie, push your button on. Is it pushed? Go ahead. I move to approve allowing members that are not present to vote. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All right. Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Aye. Okay, it passes unanimously. All right, so we are good. So now uh, we're going to go ahead and do the approval of the minutes. Um, we have two months to pass, both August and September to approve. So is there a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve. Okay, is there a second? Second. All right, um, we've got a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All right, uh, we'll go ahead and do the vote. All those in favor to approve the motion, the minutes for both August and September, say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, Laura Lee, yes, you've got a question. Yeah, I'm sorry. I thought we were voting on them one at a time, starting with August. I wasn't here at the September 17th meeting. I wish I was, but I was not able to attend. But okay. you have me as present. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so we'll make that change. Um, so let's let's um, let's do this. Uh, uh, let's do a motion to approve August. I'm sorry. Let's do August. Motion to approve August. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All right, Stephanie. Thank you. Any discussion on August? 
Okay, so we'll go ahead and vote on the approval of the August minutes. Is everyone in favor say aye? Aye. 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 Okay, all opposed? Aye. All right, so that one passes unanimously. And then we can do a motion to approve the September minutes with an edit to uh, remove Laura Lee as attendant. So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion on the September minutes? Uh, the motion on the floor is to uh, keep them except for Laura Lee was not available or not here. All right, no discussion. So let's go ahead and take a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay, so it passes. You were almost in two places at once, Laura Lee. That would have been a uh, scientific miracle. All right, so. With that done, let's go ahead and go into the progress and fiscal reports on Virginia for our monthly progress report. All right, thank you. I'm gonna keep this short. We've got a full uh, agenda today and you're gonna get the long quarterly summary uh, at your next meeting. So um, <clears throat> starting at the top, uh, we received notice um, that uh, a whole lot of our grant applications were funded um, $18.9 million in state grants for eight of our uh, swirl funded subject to sewer projects. Um, in addition, and you know, related to the lagoon, but not part of the Save Our Indian River Lagoon program, um, the county is getting $2.2 million to upgrade the South Beaches wastewater treatment plant to advanced treatment. Uh, we completed two more quick connects to existing sewer lines, two more septic upgrades, three more uh, derelict vessels removed, um, and finally our homeowner grant portal for um, the quick connects, the septic upgrades, the lateral line repairs, uh, that, that portal is now live. Um, the South Central Sea septic to sewer project, that contract was awarded, and um, then it, it is partially, that project is partially funded with American Rescue Plan funding. That funding comes with additional federal strings attached, so we're already amending that contract to add those strings. Um, so that's what that uh, contract amendment uh, note is about. The MICO septic to sewer project, we're reviewing those final bid documents, so we're hoping to get at that on the street shortly. Um, <clears throat> jumping down to the Sunset Road, Serenity Park, and Johns Road, stormwater basin outfall projects. Um, that construction is underway, but the, the contractor is experiencing delays, getting materials. We're hearing that from a lot of the county and city construction projects. It's just uh, a real, real struggle to get materials these days. So um, we'll get those projects done as quickly as we can get the supplies needed to, um, to complete the work. Sykes Creek phase one muck dredging, um, we, we are, Really, really close to recommending contract award. Um, that award process is in its final review. The shellfish aquaculture grant program that we started this year, we have um, one application that's fully processed and approved. We have three um, that are underway. And uh, today is the deadline for state innovative technology grants. We submitted pre-proposals back in mid-July and um, several of those proposals were accepted for submitting full proposals. So uh, we've been working on those full proposals and uh, one is submitted and one will be done this afternoon after, your, after this meeting is done. Um, and in terms of presentations this month, uh, Anthony got to speak with the Master Gardeners group uh, Brandon got to speak with, to the Cocoa Beach Sustainability Board. Um, Matt Battelotto got to speak to uh, the Junior Achievement uh, STEM program uh, at, at Cocoa Beach that you're gonna hear from uh, on your agenda today. And um, I got to speak at the Marine Resources Council's Lunch and Learn on the statewide stormwater rule revisions. Um, but one thing I really want to highlight in terms of upcoming events is October 21st and 22nd, the Marine Resources Council Low Impact Development Conference uh, coming up in Rockledge. You can register for that um, in advance. It's, gonna, it's a great list of speakers and it's going to be a really informative event. And that's my report. Okay, thank you, Virginia. Uh, anyone have any questions? Virginia, what was the total of the grants that, that we received? Oh, sorry. Um, the, the ones that are 
mostly funded by Save Our Lagoon that are part of the plan is $18,964,311. And then in addition to that, there's another $2.2 million to upgrade uh, wastewater treatment plant to advance. That's awesome. So $20 million in grants. Yeah. Good job. Good job to you and your staff for, and the grant writing team. Thank you all. Uh, David, yes. All right, uh, Virginia, I know uh, selecting contractors uh, for the, the Mary Island Muck Dredge, um, you know, you can't put a timeline on it, but if you were um, asked when, assuming everything goes okay, when might that project start? What's the, how far out is that? For, I didn't hear which project, Sykes Creek? Oh, the uh, Mary Island Muck Dredging. You had, you had mentioned the final contractor selection was very close. So from that to, mm -hmm. Breaking ground, how much time are we looking at? Walker's going to jump in here. Can you hear me? Oh. I hear you, yes. Okay. Um, so we've got to go through, we've got a letter of recommendation from our uh, engineering consultant. We have to do a selection committee meeting. And then I don't think it has to go directly to the board. So um, optimistically, we're looking in the next three to four months for their turn and dirt out there. Um, there's there's some I'm sorry I didn't hear that three to four months yeah three to four months okay perfect all right thank you that's all I needed I, living on Merritt Island I get you know I get approached in the street you know so um, <laughs> it's nice to have ballpark numbers thank you no problem all right thank you David um, any other questions for Virginia on the progress report I just have one go ahead Courtney yes please um, hey Virginia I see that the Grand Canal that we've um, dredged approximately 140,000 cubic yards of muck through September. How long do you think that project still has to go, given the manatee shutdowns? Um, given the, the contract expiration date, I believe it's October 23rd of 2023. Okay. Um, you know, as they get closer to the halfway point, we can reevaluate you know the the progress that they've made in the daily production rates and take a look and see if it looks like they're they're going to get to that date so as it currently stands that's our contract when do you think the finger canals will start they could possibly start as early as next week oh wow yeah okay. at the north end of grand canal wow okay great thank you no problem all right any other questions on the progress report okay uh virginia thank you so much uh we'll go to the fiscal report with Crystal, come on down. You need the, like the Price is Right theme song as you're coming down. Good morning, everyone. Are we able to see the full graph? Yes. All right. So as you can see, um, this month we received a little over $4 million in revenue. It's the highest we've received for the July months. Um, we're at, sorry, the $216 million mark. And um, we have 11.9 million in expenditures as of today and 30.6 million overall in expenditures. And it's still rising as we're definitely getting more invoices daily to finish out the fiscal year and open up the new fiscal year. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, we're running around trying to make sure close out and open and is smooth. <laughs> Anything y'all got? Happy fiscal year. <laughs> Crazy fiscal year, yes. <laughs> yeah, it looks good. Thank you, Crystal. Okay, any questions for Crystal? All right. So if not, we will go ahead and move into the other reports and special presentations section, starting out with our junior achievement uh, lagoon presentation and STEM presentation that went on. So we'll have Anne, if you could give us a presentation on that. Yeah. 
this one. Yep. There we go. You just click. All right, great. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So my name is Ann Conroy Bader. I'm president of Junior Achievement of the Space Coast. And um, we have recently uh, delved into the lagoon. Um, there's a lot of reasons for it, but I thought I'd give you a baseline in what Junior Achievement does first, just to give you context, and I'll talk about uh, what we have done recently. There we go. So Junior Achievement is actually a global organization, 103 years old. Here on the Space Coast, uh, we were founded in 1984. We place volunteers in K through 12 classrooms, and we teach programs in financial literacy, entrepreneurship, and career readiness, specifically to the Space Coast workforce readiness, which is a major topic here. We're supported by 49 board members, and we're on track to reach more than 18,000 students uh, this school year. So um, we are currently ranked number seven of 107 offices in the United States, even though we're the second smallest. That's because we run our office entrepreneurially and because Space Coast. Um, we are up 22% that uh, helped us reach that peak performance award. We on a normal year, use around 435 volunteers with an enormous uh, economic impact, um, a 12-year economic impact of about $12 million. Um, here's the why of JA. Uh, JA alumni start businesses at a much higher rate. They earn 20% more overall. Our alumni tend to finish high school. 60% 60, 60 of alumni shift. I'm particularly interested in this from low income to high middle and high income areas in adulthood. And here's what's specific to the Lagoon program. One in five JA alumni credit JA for influencing their career choices. One in three actually end up working in the same field as their JA volunteer. So the reason we're able to do pretty well across the country is that we approach JA Entrepreneurial here in, on the Space Coast. Here's an, uh, an example of a program we created for financial literacy. This program takes teenagers from age 16 to 21 with all the major um, uh, decisions they make along the way. Everything from reading their first paycheck, where did my money go, to applying for college and FAFSA, to choosing a career that has a reasonable return on investment for your education choices. JA also now we're kind of known for creating the new board members of the next generations, but we're also really cognizant of the fact that there's many pathways to success, including VOTEC, including military, and including um, apprenticeships and going right into business. This is another program uh, we do. This is on the entrepreneurial end. This is called the Balda Family Foundation Innovation Challenge. It's a teen shark tank. And we encourage kids to come up with business ideas and um, be able to present and win a pitch competition. Um, last year, we changed the focus to social innovation, uh, which means that we're now encouraging students to come up with a business idea for the greater good. Um, we are uh, this year um, placing a special emphasis on tech um, tech-related lagoon um, businesses, um, which is a new, another new turn we're doing. This is last year's. Um, we did it all online. We're hoping to be in person this year. And the third area JA uh, focuses on is workforce development. Um, the first way we did this is partnering with the EDC on um, their STEM manufacturing programs. Um, every time you hear, uh, if you're in any business panel all around the, the county, you hear about workforce development. And specifically, I mean, Taryn just moved in. They're going to be creating thousands of STEM manufacturing jobs. How do we create the next generation of kids who are interested in doing this? We also we work with the EDC to um, promote their CPT program, but also give them give kids real um, data about average salaries, average career paths, what they can expect if they go this path. We take it a step further by saying, yeah, go into um, one of these things and then open your own business when you're 30 and retire by the time you're 50. Um, we also uh, do job shadows. We take kids to workplaces. If they see it, they can be it. Uh, we're meeting with OneWeb next week uh, to um, uh, set up some um, job shadows there. And we have speaker series. This is uh, a program where we send career and business uh, experts into classrooms to tell their story. I started here. I'm there now. Uh, here are all the challenges I faced along the way. So because kids these days are under a lot of pressure, they know the stresses they're up against. They know that they don't want to go into debt. But they also have this false perception of perfection that we're trying to say, nope, momentum, education, collect people along the way, and you're going to be just fine. 
it's also broadening the career um, aspects of uh, what people, what kids think when that, that they can be when they grow up. Kids typically know what they see. They see their teachers, they see their principals, they see their, the nurses and the doctors, hopefully not too many policemen or lawyers. Um, but otherwise, it's kind of a blank slate for them. So we're trying to broaden that, that spectrum of careers they can choose. We took this program virtual during uh, COVID, have an online library of all sorts of careers. That program, Speaker Series, grew into a program we started called Women in STEM. Again, another need specific to the Space Coast. We've got to close that wage gap. We've got to close the gender inequity. So um, this program is called Women in STEM. We place three young uh, women in STEM on stage assembly style. They give short presentations and then they, the kids get a phone number that they can text their questions in anonymously um, so that the panelists can um, field those questions. We took that program this year. Actually, this is just pictures of the women in STEM. I love this program. Look at that beautiful group of kids right there. Diverse. That group to, um, picture was taken 30 minutes after school closing. They stayed to talk with those panelists to really get more information on being going into the STEM industry. One of the best questions I fielded during that Women in STEM presentation um, was I had an engineer from SpaceX, an engineer from Collins Aerospace, and a Florida Tech, tech major on, um, on uh, on stage, all three of them in, the tw in their 20s. And a young woman said, how much do you make? And the young woman from Collins stepped forward. She goes, I just turned 27. I'm well past six figures. And I looked at the audience. I'm like, who wants to be in STEM now? And it's like the arms. <laughs> <laughs> so we rolled this program into this. It's the same model. It's placing three young professionals on stage to field questions, to hear from experts. Um, we, uh, I called my, uh, my friend, Dr. Rendell, at Cocoa Beach High. I was like, he was the one who uh, piloted the Women in STEM program. He's like, yeah, bring it. Uh, Cocoa Beach High School is surrounded by, three, um, by water on three sides. So um, we recruited three speakers, Dr. Kelly Hunsucker, Jody Palmer, and Matt in the back, we're about to embarrass him. Um, and uh, we had the, the assembly on September 30th. Cocoa Beach split the groups into three age groups so that the speakers could be appropriate in the way they're approaching who, the, the age group of the, who they were talking to. Um, and, oh, my picture's gonna be blurry, my apologies. Um, but, and, and from JA's perspective, this group of people, this, these students were fantastic, but it was also the first time since uh, COVID that we were able to be live in front of students. So it was a really special, on, special day on multiple levels. 950 students we saw that day. There's Dr. Hunsucker, she killed it, talking about oceanography at Florida Tech. There was Matt um, doing his thing. There's Jody talking about restore show, shores at the zoo and her love of manatees. And here's a video, of, oh, yo, it's gonna play. Sorry, Matt, here we go. Matt was a big hit. Oh, the sound's not gonna go. Oh, my apologies, but. Um, actually, here's proof. Here's uh, Matt being mobbed by a group of kids for his autograph. <laughs> Um, the kids were engaged, they were lively, um, they were rowdy at some points, um, and uh, it was overall a big success. We had several um, members of this committee attend that day. Uh, Laura Lee uh, explained to me about the, I've got to post a public notice next time so that we, uh, if we've got that many people from the oversight committee in a room. Um, and since then, I put out the invitation to other schools uh, to see who would be interested in this program. And so far, Hoover Middle School, Vera High School, Edgewood, Satellite High School, and Coco Junior Senior are interested in enrolling this program out. So we will be, do we will be doing a call for speakers. We're going to create a pool of um, uh, experts on the lagoon. Uh, I'm also going to double dip and any women who uh, are in that program, I'm going to pull them into the Women in STEM program also so that we can um, broaden that perspective as well. And I'm also going to do one thing here, so, um, and then I'll take questions on the program. But uh, the JA has a business hall of fame that we induct laureates into every year. Um, you'll see uh, the Herndons, um, Frank DeBello from Space Florida, Bob Cabana, director of uh, Kennedy Space Center, now number two at NASA overall. And then last year was the Swans, um, who started talking to me about uh, Lugan issues along with Laura Lee um, and Robert Jordan. 
So we just chose our laureates this week. Um, the first one is Travis Proctor. He uh, owns, he's CEO of Artemis IT. And uh, he's a huge philanthropist. He's chair of the Board of Trustees for Florida Tech at the moment, at the young age of 45. But our second inductee is of particular interest to this group, I think, is Dr. DeFries. So um, Dr. DeFries will be uh, inducted as a laureate on March 5th, 2022 at Port Canaveral. So just wanted to say congratulations on all his hard work and accomplishments. So. That is my presentation. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ann. Anyone have any questions? David, do you have a question? I don't have a question, but I attended, and it was really, um, the, the students were incredibly receptive. I think it's a great entryway for us um, who care about the lagoon to be able to reach uh, a young audience that is enthusiastic that also cares about a lot of these causes and in turn you know take that information home to the rest of their family and help them you know know what's going on what they can do how they can get involved um, I think the awareness and reach that this can have is, is fantastic and congratulations Anne for Thank doing you. this um, it's, it's really transformative our, in, our intention here, and I didn't explain this well, is that you all know how long this effort is going to take. It's a decades-long project. So we've got to start now educating the new generations to have a baseline of knowledge on the lagoon, perhaps choose careers that can help the lagoon, but also just be aware of initiatives that are coming up and the ways they can help. The one thing we did was um, we had Kelsey Mack from the city of Cocoa Beach. on, on um, She closed out the program with hands-on um, volunteer opportunities that the kids could delve right into. I am still getting questions on my phone about, uh, you know, what group can I, should I go to about turtles? What should a group should I go to about manatees? So the kids are interested, engaged, and um, hopefully this is going to create that next generation. That's awesome. Any other questions? Okay, well, I do see Dr. DeFries is one of our attendees, so congratulations, Dr. DeFries, on a well-deserved uh, uh, acknowledgement. Um, and, and I know um, from the committee's standpoint, we've talked for years about getting education, Stephanie, you particularly, uh, and Courtney and Kimberly, and so I think this program, um, finding somebody in the community who is so good at doing what they do and having them help spread our word is, is awesome. Um, because it is going to be decades, and I don't know if I'm going to be sitting in this chair for decades, <laughs> but it'd be nice to have somebody who has that passion come in and take it, um, take the reins from all of us. So, um, thank you very much, Ann. All right. So we'll go ahead and go with the next um, presentation. Okay. And um, Jim Langenbach is joining us virtually. So while Crystal gets that pulled up and we get the presentation going, um, this is really a follow on to the conversation that was started at the last meeting, <clears throat> excuse me, where uh, Dr. Fox presented on um, some muck capping research that he had done. And there was a whole lot of dialogue. And so we wanted you to know we've actually been exploring that in one of the muck projects in Cocoa Beach. Um, so Jim Langenbach is the consultant for that project. He's going to be presenting an update on, on where that project is. And I want to recognize uh, Wayne Caragino from the city is here. He's been managing the, the muck dredging projects for the city of Cocoa Beach. So um, with that, it uh, looks like we're ready, Jim. Okay, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Jim. Excellent. Um, thank you. I, I would have preferred to be in person this morning, but I actually um, am out of state on project work this week, so I couldn't be there today. Um, but this morning, uh, what I'd like to do is we're going to basically give an overview of what we've been working with, what Geosyntech's been working on the last um, about a year uh, with regards to the Cocoa Beach uh, muck dredging capping project. Mm -hmm give you an update on all our sort of our field investigations and an alternative evaluation we've gone through. So I'll give you a little bit of uh, project area background, a summary of our field and investigation findings, uh, we'll talk through our alternatives evaluated to address uh, the muck issue, and um, path forward, you know, sort of from where we're, where we're headed. <clears throat> and if you have questions, certainly, um, you know, don't hesitate to ask me questions during the, the presentation, and there will be an opportunity, um, you know, when, when, I'm, when I'm done as well. I don't think I'll be able to see, you know, hands raised. So if uh, somebody raises a hand and I, I can't see it and I seem like I'm ignoring somebody, I'm not doing it on purpose. 
somebody maybe just cut me off and I can stop and, and anybody can answer, I can answer the question. So project location, this is the area within the Banana River. Um, it's actually the largest identified capital improvement single project um, in the Sorrel project plan. It's intended to address uh, muck deposit uh, identified as, as a significant contributor of nitrogen and phosphorus. You can see the, the location on the right. It essentially surrounds the uh, Cocoa Beach Country Club area um, and is south of uh, Cocoa Beach uh, Junior Senior High School. As um, Virginia mentioned in the introduction, uh, the city of Cocoa Beach is leading this project. Uh, Wayne Caragino, city of Cocoa Beach is a project manager and they've got an interagency agreement um, in place with Brevard County on this project. Uh, statistics, you know, this is the statistics coming out from this project uh, that were in the, the Sorrel plan. So in the Sorrel plan, it was estimated that there was about a 140 acre muck deposit with a little less, a little under a million cubic yards of muck. Uh, associated with that 140 acre muck deposit, was an estimated uh, 42,000 pounds per year total nitrogen uh, flux potential, 3,000 pounds per year <clears throat> total phosphorus uh, flux to the Banana River. It was a significant contributor. Um, and the Soro plan estimated a total of about 34 million, which with about 21, you know, well, 21 and change associated with the actual muck removal and 12.8 million associated with interstitial water treatment. This is assuming if you went you know, a standard um, dredging approach. And that was based upon you know, pre-investigation quantities and sort of the Sorrel project plan assumptions going in prior to you know, you know, some of these other muck projects uh, taking place and having sort of uh, live you know, unit rate costs for things and stuff like that. So I'm going to jump in and kind of go through the field investigations that we've been involved with in, uh, essentially in 2021 that wrapped up. You know, they, we started in with field work activities in various phases beginning in the January, February timeframe. And the last phase of work was essentially completed in September, um, sort of completing the, the final uh, seagrass survey. So just to give everybody a feel here, sort of the, the first one, of the first things that was done was a, a full-scale um, bathymetric survey of the project area. Uh, this is an area where the river bottom was historically mined, um, you know, basically to get our the fill that was used to create the land area. That's now the Cocoa Beach Country Club and <clears throat> um, the, the high school area. Um, so you can see you basically got an area where water depths range from about you know, four feet around the peripheral edge of this whole air project area. And then they drop off to depths as deep as uh, 24 feet with the deepest sort of dredge holes uh, located south of uh, Cocoa Beach High School. And you can literally see the sort of the shape of the old probably you know, clamshell um, you know, techniques that were used to actually mine this material um, when, it, when it was dug out. And then, you know, you know so the, but the west side, you know, the open water side of the Banana River, west of the golf course, you've got typical um, water depth, um, you know, in the, in the 12 to 14 uh, foot depth range. And then the channel, that's the 400 channel that, that comes off the, um, the Banana River um, and, and runs, you know, along the south side of the, the country club. Uh, that's got typical water depths of 10 to 12 feet and uh, you know, there's deep water behind the high school with depths ranging from 15 to up to 24 foot deep um, you know, depths. So some pretty deep holes back in that area. This does make it a little bit more challenging in terms of your typical sort of project where you're um, going out there to evaluate you know, muck thickness and collect sediment samples and such when you've got water depths of 20 foot 20 plus feet, it's a little trickier to, to collect data. So some of the field investigations through the sediment collection, here's just a, a picture. I'll just go through, run through a few photos. This is, uh, we had we did 20 uh, Vibracore uh, sediment core samples throughout the project area. So distributed throughout this, that area that I just showed. Um, and that was the idea to, you know, collect those cores 
uh, to get an, an understanding of, uh, you know, visual understanding of, of muck distribution and thickness and what the bottom sediments look like. Uh, based upon what we were seeing in some of the Vibracore samples, underlying the muck in this area, so the muck's an organic silt, uh, underlying that muck is a, a gray, silty, clayey material. So it's kind of, it, it made some interesting, but we saw that in, in some areas we saw we transitioned to sort of the typical sort of hard sand bottom, but other areas we went into this clay material. So <clears throat> to kind of confirm whether that was um, actually, you know, natural deposits, we did some uh, three locations. We went out on the golf course in the southeast, southwest, and northwest corners of the golf course and actually did direct push technology uh, macro cores, so continuous soil cores down to 50 feet, just to correlate um, sort of natural lithology uh, along with the, the sediment profiles we're seeing in the river. Um, and then we did uh, over 500 locations where we, we did probe measurements, where we essentially we'd measure uh, water column depth with a, with a, a secchi disc where we drop that down and see where it would settle on the top of the, the, the mud, muck profile, then push the probe through the muck uh, so we basically hit our hit resistance um, and measured measured those locations, and then also correlated them back to the Vibracore data. Just a couple of additional photos. You know, here's pulling pulling the Vibracore. As Vibracore cores come out, they come out in a plastic sleeve um, that's then cut into five foot segments, uh, you know, kind of wrapped up on the on the boat. And then when the barge does it, a few of those locations, uh, they, they bring those uh, two back to the shore. And then we had a hydrogeologist on site that's um, then you know, basically they, they butterfly the cores, um, log the lithology, um, and then also collect samples, representative samples for the different laboratory testing we're doing. So on the bottom left, you see sort of a typical butterfly core, five foot segments. Photo on the upper right, is the DPT macro cores, and you can see um, below a depth of about 20 and 25 feet, you transition to a clay, and that's where we see that soft, soft clay sediments. And that makes sense. That's probably why when they were when they were digging um, the material around the golf course and behind the high school, that's kind of where they'd stop. They would they would dig down, uh, you know, they're mining uh, material for fill. And then when they started mining out clay material, that doesn't make for good fill. So that's where they sort of that's where they stop their their, their digging and sort of move around. That's why you see these these uh, pits and areas out there. Um, photograph seven is just sort of a zoom in, your typical sort of typical muck photo that you'd see uh, associated with our cores uh, from the from this project area. Putting it all onto a map, um, this is kind of what we see. Um, Essentially, there's our 522 probe locations. The, the dot, the, the dot, the VC identify the locations throughout are our Vibracore uh, collected locations. Orange dots are the uh, those, those locations I said we collected out on the golf course. <clears throat> and then from enough from these cores, we did a, a you know host of analysis. Um, you know, I'm not going to read through them all, but it's a pretty pretty lengthy uh, list of, of analyses, including uh, various chemical con chemical constituents uh, to, to just get a, a handle on on what was uh, whether there was any chemical issues associated with the the muck, which could certainly have, um, be something to consider when you're looking at your you know potentially alternatives and and how you're going to uh, handle or dispose of that material. What we did find, um, and you can see by the red the red contour, is the uh, trace of the muck footprint um, that we mapped within this project area based upon the combination of Ibercore and probe locations. <clears throat> so we mapped an area of 160 acres of muck. Um, so it was about 15% larger than the, the 140 acres that was um, you know, in the original Sorrel project plan. So pretty close um, to, to, you know, in terms of comparison muck footprint wise. And you can see it, it the, the muck contour and where it's located very, very specifically matches where the depth you know, start to drop off into this uh, area that was historically mined for for fill. <clears throat> now we get into sort of the, the muck volume results. So taking um, taking the thickness measurements along with the Vibracore data, the 
assimilating that, um, interpolating it, and looking at it from a, a few different statistical approaches, we end up with a muck volume of uh, 1.4 to 1.8 million cubic yards of muck present within the project area. <clears throat> and you can see there's some pretty significant thickness of muck deposit west of the west of the golf course. Uh, <clears throat> you know, this green contour line that surrounds it, where the you know the, the heat map is showing it, you know, transitioning to the darker brown. And that's areas where the muck um, is over 10 feet thick. And then the blue contour that sort of surrounds those areas um, is the area where you've got muck um, five feet or more. So you basically have, you know, this, this heat map is showing muck, you know, ranging from essentially zero to the maximum measured thickness of uh, 15 and a half feet. Um, so the muck volume is 50 to 80% larger than the soil plant estimate. Um, and the muck directly overlays sort of these soft clay sediments in, in, in many areas. Um, and just kind of putting some of that up in the upper right, you see just putting some of those, um, you know, quantities into some sort of perspective that you can try to sort of wrap your head around. Um, you can see they, they represent some pretty large numbers. And just for reference, like when I had the reference to how many sort of football fields, 10 foot thick with muck, um, you know, it's a lot, and you know, sort of here's here's what the here's a football field size. So picture that many football fields, ten foot thick with muck, and that's, that's what you're talking about here. Uh, we took our our nitrogen and phosphorus data, um, you know, plugged it into these sort of quantities to calculate well just how much muck, how much nitrogen is stored um, in this in this uh, deposit, and you're looking at you know 1,800 to 2,000 tons of nitrogen. 14 to 1,700 tons of phosphorus. Um, and then the chemical analysis where I'm gonna present a whole lot of data or words on the next slide uh, really didn't, didn't show us a whole lot, which is good in terms of finding. Um, so it was pretty similar to other tested uh, county dredge sites. So you know, in the field investigation on the sediment, uh, we collected our sediment samples and then basically screen them against uh, Florida's soil cleanup target level. So it's basically, if you were to take this material out of the water and apply it somewhere to land it, now it's no longer sediment, it's now soil, screen them against uh, Florida's soil cleanup levels. And none of the 20 uh, locations we sampled for VOCs, seeded standards, similarly, similarly with uh, semi-vol organic compounds, herbicides, pesticides, uh, PCBs. We also had uh, 10 of the locations uh, we analyzed for the full suite of uh, PFAS uh, constituents. The state only has provisional soil cleanup target levels for PFOS and PFOA, so two of the 24. Um, they did not you know, exceed those soil cleanup target levels. The remaining 22 individual PFAS compounds were all less than the laboratory detection limit or were an estimated value, meaning they had, they qualified the value because it was between the method detection limit and the and the laboratory practical quantitation limit. So meaning they saw a little a little blip of something but can't even really uh, quantify accurately what that number is. Of the 10 metal, um, different metals that were analyzed from the 20 different locations, arsenic exceeded the, the residential standard, um, no exceedance of commercial, and we had a couple of chromium uh, leachability um, exceedances. So this is you know, really similar to what we see like in all the analysis on the, uh, the for example, the, the Grand Canal system. You know, these results um, are actually a little, le little less than what we see in, in some of the Grand Canal samples, but uh, real, real similar. And then uh, total petroleum hydrocarbons, <clears throat> they did exceed the residential um, standard in 15 of the 20, but what we do is uh, when you, uh, car, total petroleum hydrocarbons represents everything from the C8 to C40 carbon range, and we can speciate that um, with the, an approved methodology. Uh, we took the highest result from the data set, had that result speciated, so it breaks it down into carbon range specific analysis and then compares those to specific state standards, and none of those exceeded any of the carbon range specific um, soil plant markers. Basically showing that what hydrocarbon is in the muck is a, a very weathered, heavy, long chain carbon, and it, and it doesn't exceed standards. <clears throat> um, 
Um, part of the work, um, our teaming partner is Applied Ecology. Um, they did a wetland and species evaluation as, long, as well as the submerged aquatic vegetation survey. Um, the, wet, <clears throat> the wetland and listed species work was conducted in the spring of 2021. Um, and then uh, we, they, at that time, they actually did a preliminary seagrass survey, just you know, some, some initial transects, which were then used to discuss with the DEP uh, during a meeting in um, late August, which we have pre uh, received a, um, an approved survey approach, um, which was a bit of a, a modification, so we didn't have to do it as extensive based upon our preliminary findings. Um, basically, there's virtually, you know, in a nutshell, there's virtually no seagrass present in the project area which is consistent with the 2019 St. John's Water Management District survey work. We did have a few locations with quadrant densities that were less than 6%, but here a lot of times they're, they're literally mapping a few sprigs of seagrass um, at, at some locations. And they are where you one would expect, where you're right up against some, some mangrove lines and it's real shallow water. <clears throat> kind of getting now into our uh, alternatives assessment. We've collected all this field data. We've processed it. We've got our footprints. We've got our muck volume. We understand the chemical characteristics. Uh, now we're kind of walking in through some alternatives that we developed because looking at this site is not necessarily a site that you just go out there and, and do standard uh, dredging. So we just wanted to look at some different uh, um, alternatives. And we kind of needed to benchmark everything against something. So our benchmark is sort of the do nothing approach. And I'm just going to, as I go through these, I'll give some advantages and disadvantages of each. <clears throat> you know, do nothing. Obviously, it's lowest cost. You don't have heavy construction equipment and associated impact infrastructure, meaning like driving trucks down Minuteman um, causeway, things like that. And you're not going to, you know, some of our alternatives you'll look at, you'll see that we basically take out a section of the golf course for a portion of time. So you don't have any loss of golf course if you do nothing. You know, obviously disadvantages of leading in place a large nitrogen phosphorus, um, you know, uh, potential contributor to the river. <clears throat> Anticipate a lack of and a reduced rate of water quality improvement over time. It sort of ignores the science and research recommendations that you can sort of need to be doing something to address these issues. Um, and you never know, down the road, it could, if you can't meet your um, BMAP requirements, it could result in, you know, future, you know, regulatory issues um, trying to meet the and we looked at dredging, you know, sort of this would be the standard dredging approach. <clears throat> um, in this approach, just to kind of go through it, how we, we did our cost evaluation is essentially based upon going out there and doing hydraulic dredging, uh, creating a, a temporary dredge material management area, essentially, which would use a portion of the golf course, you know, kind of identified the southern golf course area. And keep in mind that with this kind of volume, um, like the Pineda uh, dredge material management area, you know, you've probably driven by, that's, that's about five acres. <clears throat> you, to process this much muck, you're not going to be able to use a five acre DMA unless you want the project to span for 10 or 15 years. You just can't get that kind of the throughput you need. So the dredge material management area would have to be considerably larger for a project like this. So we kind of have a, a, a larger, um, you know, project work area, a larger um, uh, geo, you know, uh, processing area, uh, interstitial water treatment area, and then and what we were actually envisioning if we did an alternative like this would the pond network around here, around this dredge material management area, could be used as part of the um, interstitial water treatment train. So it's part, you know, basically a you know linked together as part of the. A, flow through cycle for the um, interstitial water floor water treatment before then go back into the river. <clears throat> Some advantages, you know, um, dredging, it's a standard approach. Um, you know, it, there's a sort of an, a methodology in place for getting TMDL credits, lower maintenance follow-up costs. It's not new to the regulatory body. Some disadvantages, well, given the quantity of muck we're talking about here, if you were to um, haul it away, it's 60,000 plus some truckloads of muck. Um, you know, the issue with siting and capacity, you know, uh, you're going to have to take out essentially a part of the, the golf course. We kind of looked at, oh, what about behind the high school? This area is just simply not large enough. You know, this area right here um, represents about five acres. It's just not large enough to, to site a, a dredge material management area. Um, disadvantages, obviously, you know, the issues associated with poor water treatment and the complexities of, of getting uh, the material out of, out of the water stream. 
really not in, in resulting in any habitat creation when you're done with this project. What you're left with, if you remove all the muck, is, is basically you've just you know, you've carved out the pit, and it's, it's once again a deep pit. Um, and one of the things we did find, another disadvantage sort of a, a, a dredging approach here is we did a bunch of sampling also of the gray uh, silty clay material underlying uh, the muck, and it actually has high levels of uh, nat natural levels of nitrogen and phosphorus. So, you know, you're basically removing the muck and you have in place now a surface area of clay material that's got elevated levels of phosphorus in it. Certainly its flux rate would be a lot lower because it's, um, you know, a much lower permeability material um, or similar, but it's a little lower permeability. You expect it to have a lower flux rate, but you, you, know, you, you do have, it's not like you have a clean sort of phosphorus-free bottom to the project area when you're done. Um, there is some disposal uncertainties. You know, at, at what point um, do you get in a situation where, you know, uh, ag folks or whoever don't want that this material applied on on, on, on their land, and, and if you had to end up taking it to a, a landfill, certainly the cost can completely um, you know, blow up a lot further than they already are. Um, Using this approach, we're looking at an implementation time frame of in the you know, five to eight year horizon and an estimated cost of uh, 75 plus million dollars to remove this month using dredging. We then looked at um, sand capping. Uh, this is a, um, a pretty standard approach. It's off, it's, so it's not routinely used in Florida. Um, it's often used on um, you know, in riverine systems, on uh, canal systems, on lakes. Um, it's mm -hmm. often used at like, you know, even like Superfund type sites. Geosyntech's been involved in a number of projects where we've used it at uh, camp capping approach as an EPA approved methodology for capping um, things like PCBs and, 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 and mercury and, and other chemical constituents. Um, there's been some research done uh, by FIT that it has the potential to, to reduce um, you know, nitrogen and phosphorus flux that was some of the work that was done over at the uh, FPL site. Some other advantage, you're, sort of, you're eliminating the dredge material management area. Um, <clears throat> the poor water treatment issues are alle alleviated. You're not, out of, you're not physically dredging and removing muck and dealing with the interstitial water. Um, you are creating some habitat. You know, as you're, you're adding sand uh, cap, you are uh, bringing certain areas, you have the water depth of certain areas is seven feet, and now you're adding two foot of sand. You've now brought it up into sort of a, the, the, the window of depth where you can actually, if the water quality is improved, you can actually get uh, seagrass growth and some better habitat. We did not a tremendous amount created by this project, but looking at it from the, we, we did look at it, and it ends up being about a, a one mile long strip, about five feet wide, so about a half acre of additional area that would kind of come up into the habitat window. And that's just assuming um, sand, a two foot sand cap. And for our analysis, um, we used two, a two foot sand cap distributed throughout the overall project area. But the reality is if the sand capping approaches, um, you know, moves forward as it sort of goes into the design, you'd have a, we'd have a sand cap with a lot of variability in thickness. So um, certain areas may get a sand cap that's six inches thick. Certain areas may get a cap that's six feet thick uh, or more. So, but we had, uh, but for evaluating uh, the alternative, we assumed a, a two foot sand cap throughout, which is about a half a million cubic yards of sand that we brought in. Estimated cost for the sand capping is about $35 million. Um, in terms of some disadvantages, it, it hasn't been completed large scale in the Indian River Lagoon. Um, it's a pretty large volume of sand to bring in still. You know, it's, it's not, um, it, you know, 500,000 cubic yards. And that, that's just based on two foot. If we, um, you know, modified that and went to an average thickness of three foot, it obviously would, would increase that. Um, there is the advantage from the perception that, you know, some of the sort of perception that, that maybe this muck remains. Um, but, you know, the reality is it is, it is essentially capped and it is just an organic uh, silt layer that would then be sort of um, compressed down over time. And then there is some cap monitoring and maintenance 
And then there's the um, sort of disadvantage of your potential, but what's sort of the long-term nitrogen box and phosphorus uh, flux reduction performance, you know, over over the long haul. So, so this kind of just running through some advantages and disadvantages. And uh, Florida, you know, in Florida, there has been some some sand cap projects done. Uh, Palm Beach County has done some capping. They've, they've actually got, they call it the uh, Grassy Flats uh, Restoration Project, where they've done an ecological restoration using sand capping approaches. Um, they've also used sand capping for capping over 100 acres of different um, deep, um, you know, sort of former mined locations uh, within the within the river, the lagoon system in South Florida. And um, we were doing a search, and we found basically that they, they actually have a cap um, that's being constructed right now project called Bonefish Cove. It's like a 40-acre sand cap being put in and down in Palm Beach County. Just want to give you an idea, since you may not be as familiar with it, you know, sort of what, what some of the technologies that are used to, to apply um, a sand cap because you know, we're applying a sand on top of a, a applying sand on top of a, a soft sediment. And everybody sometimes would just think, oh, the Sand's just going to sink right through the through the soft sediment. It's not going to support it, and that's that can be the case if the sand cap is not applied properly or done in a in an incremental method. What we found is on these soft for capping soft sand sediments or capping soft sediments, you're doing it in lifts. We do it in thin lifts. Um, you, you put a, a thin lift down, uh, say a three to six inch lift, a very specific design lift, and then you give it time for that for some for the compression to occur. Um, and, it, and that muck that it is gaining shear strength, basically a geotechnical term that this, well, maybe what the, you know, the muck is consolidating and it's getting stronger because it's being compressed. And then you add the next lift. So it's sort of a stepwise the addition of lifts uh, of sand as the cap is being built. And here's just some types of equipment that, have, that have, you know, are used to do that. There's a picture on the upper left of a sand shooter system, where it's basically a a hopper on a barge that then has a conveyor belt that essentially is, is shooting the sand out. Um, <clears throat> the bottom left is a, they call it a telestacker. Um, and on the upper right is a, a photograph of us um, basically doing a QA, QC program on a telestacker. It's kind of a neat um, photo because it's showing how you can very accurately calibrate um, you know, this, this piece of equipment and, and have a high level of comfort that you're you're getting the sand distributed on the, on the, on a very specific pattern uh, as you're developing sort of a grid layout for the for the placement of the sand material. Some different, you know, there's a lot of different types of equipment that's used for for sand capping. The you know, upper left is a contractor Sevenson. One of their, they have a large, you know, their, their sort of hydraulic capper system. And on the bottom left, um, you can actually see this is a sand cap being installed sort of in a riverine system. But I like this photo because in the background you see the uh, the land large you know the sort of the sand pile, and then it's being hydraulically fed to this uh, capper system, which is applying the sand. Uh, upper right is a hydraulic uh, sand feed system, what they call a moon pool. So sort of the moon pool is where the the cap is being applied to so sort of that that specific box or grid, and then the the dredge with the with the sand feed system moves. And it just kind of incrementally moves and moves and moves, and you know the checkerboard and is putting down the sand cap system. And then on the bottom right is a just sort of a small uh, small feed plant. So they range in in, size, in sizes um, and types and variety, but there's a small feed plant system with a small hopper that uh, sort of uh, spray spray applies uh, the dry feed uh, for the for the sands, or something like that could be done in a, you know, in a, in a canal or things like that. <clears throat> the other alternative we, another alternative that we looked at is, is golf course placement. Um, the idea here, rather than hauling the muck away, let's uh, sort of permanently place it on the golf course and then essentially cap it and contour and place the golf course back on top of the, um, of, of the consolidated muck. Another advantage here, so advantage and disadvantage is the same process. It eliminate the issues with the muck T and D again. Um, sort of some of those cost uncertainties with muck disposal go away. A little potential, sh you know, shorter time frames. So you're not hauling all this material. The idea is you stack the geotubes, um, just like those. You, if you drive by Pineda, you'll see those geotubes where they'll dewater 
hearing is occurring. But in this situation, you're essentially, you know, laying them out and then you're, you're stacking them over time. But you still use the pond system leverage for water treatment because you do still have the interstitial water treatment aspect. And then you're actually, you know, one can argue, well, you're actually creating some topography for the golf course, which could be kind of cool. Um, disadvantages, you know, obviously this would need some heavy-duty community support because you're, you know, taking up a, a good chunk of the golf course, taking it out of action for a period of time. Um, you know, the significant muck quantity results in large uh, footprint and elevation changes. This was an interesting, pot, you know, concept when we were thinking that the muck volume, it you know, was maybe less than a, a million cubic yards, but now we're, you know, we're talking. 1.4 to 1.8 million cubic yards. It's, it's you know it's a it's a, a large volume of muck to deal with and, and look at. Um, you have yeah, monitoring maintenance issues. You you have the potential groundwater flux now. You have got this cap system, but now as the as the uh, material continues to drain and if water that moves through it, um, it's going to carry nitrogen and phosphorus via groundwater. So we basically, as we evaluated this, we needed to look at um, and develop a uh, sort of a treatment plan for the groundwater uh, nitrogen phosphorus flux that will be coming off the uh, cap area. And this had a cost of about, it's similar to dredging, by the time you add on all these other features, you end up with a cost of about you know, $73 million. So a little less than standard dredging, uh, but still you know, up there in, in, the, in the realm of pricing. And just a quick cartoon, just to, to kind of give an understanding of what, what this sort of would look like. Um, none of this is the scale, of course, but just this idea that here you got the golf course area, you stack these uh, sea waters, these geotubes, you contour over that and essentially re recreate your golf course on top of the this capped area. Um, and then to deal with any potential you know, nutrient-laden groundwater that, that moves through this, um, you'd have sort of a passive reactive barrier system and or an engineered phytoremediation system, sort of like a tree well system to um, mitigate against those nutrient loads to the lagoon. That was just the fourth alternative. We did look at one additional alternative, um, and that was a subaqueous placement and capping uh, with ecological restoration. This Alternative, I, I really like this alternative going in, and I was, I was really hoping the numbers were going to work out a little better than they did on this one. Uh, the advantage of this is, you know, you're reducing the mucking, the muck barging and trucking issues, um, and it provides for a potential significant ecological and habitat enhancement. The idea, in a nutshell here, is taking the, the muck from this whole southern and western side of the project area temporarily isolating this area. So picture this area being isolated, the southeast corner where it's deeper. So we know there's a, a pretty good volume for storage, pumping the muck into this area and not filling it up the land surface, but filling it up to some depth. Maybe that depth um, is, you know, uh, a two feet to say six feet and then capping on top of that. So when it's done, you essentially have an environment in this area identified as number three, you'd have a, um, a depth that ranges from six inches to um, a few feet primarily, but you're gonna still have to have a, a, a channel that comes through here um, that, that, that provides for navigation. And then when that, pro and then you can go through and, and, and essentially plant mangroves and do sort of a complete ecological restoration on top of the sand cap, which is now, you know, essentially um, covered, you know, that muck volume all placed into this, this area um, and then reconnect, you know, to back to the lagoon system. Um, what we did find out was, you know, these volume, the volumes worked wonderfully when we were talking about 975,000 cubic yards of muck or less and, and, the, and the volumes associated with the west side based upon that, you know, the ratio of the volume. What we found with the 1.4 to 1.8 million cubic yards is it's you're just not able to, to fit that muck um, into that area, and therefore you've got an additional you know half a million cubic yards of muck to deal with. So you're going to need a DMMA. So now you have the cost of building the dredge material management area and then still having to to, to haul off um, a, a, you know portion of the muck. Um, 
And it does have some just, you know, disadvantages in terms of it, it'll be fairly complex exercise to maintain the navigation channel through the project area um, during the time frame where the work is occurring. So, you know, you have this uh, 400 channel that comes through and then you've got, deep, you know, basically a um, boat traffic comes through here, comes along the north side of this island and then goes up into the residential area, you know, maintaining that um, during the performance of the project work while you're really trying to isolate it also um, has some, some pretty significant complexities associated with it. Um, it's also, while we've met with the various agencies, they all said this is, it, all these alternatives are doable from a permitting perspective. Um, this one would be a little more complex to, uh, to sort of pull off in terms of the, the permitting aspects of it. And the estimated costs for um, the subaqueous uh, placement and capping is in the mid 50s to upper $70 million range. So it has the potential to be a little less than standard dredging or the golf course cap placement. But, um, the, you know, the, the cost uncertainties go back to and ultimately how much um, you have to haul off site and uh, the permitting complexities and, and dealing with the G DMMA and the interstitial pore water and the magnitude of treatment. So those are sort of the five five different alternatives that we've we've run through and looked at. Um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, sort of the do nothing, essentially no lowest cost, the sand capping in the mid thirty million dollar range, and then um, the two different you know sort of dredging type approaches in the uh, mid to upper seventies, and then the subaqueous uh, uh, capping uh, ecological restoration of that of that sort of area three sort of in the mid 50s to, to mid $70 million range. So just kind of wrapping up here, um, sort of a path forward. Path forward is ultimately going to be sort of select the alternative, um, finalize our alternative assessment document, which incorporates all the 2021 field investigations and work data collection um, and, the, and this, uh, the other activities that were done by um, Applied Ecology. Um, we could see essentially in 2022 if we have an approved alternative, developing the design documents, uh, conducting additional geotechnical testing as warranted, uh, preparing engineering drawings and specs, contract and contractor procurement, um, as, and parallel to that work, uh, permitting activities in 2022 with a potential project implementation. You know, of course, pending the ability to fund. Um, in 2023, um, also pending permit approvals um, associated with those permitting activities in 2022. That's really what I have for you today. Um, be happy to, to, to take any questions. I know that's a, a lot of information to, to digest and, and sort of um, put on you all at once there. No, that, thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. Um, Wayne, did you want to come down and add anything to that? Just and thank you very much for being here. Good morning, everybody. My name is Wayne Gargi, and I'm the project manager for the city of Cocoa Beach for this project. Um, what we did recently, um, Geosyntec, number one, Geosyntec is doing an excellent job. Uh, I've never seen this amount of um, data collected. and. Um, so what, what we have to do is bring it to our commission. So what we decided to do um, was to meet with them one-on-one -on -one individually, present pretty much what you guys just saw um, to each one of our commissioners and try to get uh, some feedback from them. Um, but eventually what, what we're gonna do is bring this to our commission, uh, the first commission meeting of November, which is November 4th. Um, and we got um we're, we're trying to remain objective with them so the agenda item will not have a staff recommendation but i mean when you start to look at the alternatives here there's one that just comes you know blaring out at you as you know the way to go so um we got positive response for that um some of these have such challenges for cocoa beach um, the DMMA is, is, is all beachside, you know, you're dealing with it in Satellite Beach, everybody. That's the, the issue with all this. We don't have the land for them. Um, they're such an impact on our infrastructure. So 
the one alternative and I'm going to remain objective can eliminate a lot of that. that. So that's what we're hoping happens. Um, and we got uh, good feedback from our commissioners. Um, and we'll keep our fingers crossed. Great. You know, when it comes down to it, quite frankly, it comes down to money. And, you know, there's a big delta there between s some of these alternatives. So, and the other ones, uh, you know, it's cutting edge too. We, we, um, we're not afraid of cutting edge in Cocoa Beach. And um, if we can, you know, get everybody on board and, and do this, it, it could be a big game changer in, in the whole grand scheme of things. So that's what we're hoping for too. Great. Uh, I think Laura Lee's got a question and then we'll, we'll get everybody's questions in. Go ahead, Laura Lee. This might be a really stupid question, but is there, first of all, um, where do you get your sand source from? Is it being mined over in the central part of the state and trucked over here? And would it be possible to haul in enough sand to just fill in the entire area and bring it up to a level where seagrass would grow around the golf course and, and the bottom of the river would be like it was before it was dredged? Jim, you want to take that one? Sure. Um, <clears throat> we did actually, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, I just want to make sure the mic went back to me. Um, we, for the alternative assessment, we actually looked at um, multiple sources to get actual price per cubic yard for sand so we can get accurate pricing. So we actually, there's two alternatives for sand. It's basically um, sand that's uh, similar to sort of the beach renourishment project type sand that gets trucked in. Um, so, you know, those contractors that provide the, the same similar types of sand that you see put on the on the beach. We basically got their you know price per cubic yard, and those are from you know in, in, inland sources. Um, and then we also looked at um, Canaveral Shoals, uh, the permitted uh, sand site that's out off the port, with the idea that um, let's get some. We also got costs from uh, you know, conceptual costs, of course, from contractors to bring in sand, meaning mine it from the permitted Canaveral Shoals location, bring it through the lock in um, barge, and then essentially bring it down to Banana River where they could hook up to, a, say, one of these hydraulic um, applicator systems and, and, and apply the sand. Um, pricing was, I thought for sure, you know, bringing it through you know, from the Canaveral Shoals um, bringing it through the port and down down the river, and it's only like, like five miles from from the port uh, to the project site or less. That that would be um, a more efficient and cost effective on a price per cubic yard. But it ended up being about the same. So we we looked at it. it if if this alternative was to go forward, the design specs um, would would essentially and the and the pricing would would enable a contractor to um, bid it either way, at least that's how I'd envision it. Um, bid it either using a Canaveral Shoals sort of sand source or, or bid it, uh, or, or they could use a, an inland um, source that meets the, the whatever we de you know, define as the spec for that sand and um, sort of let the, the best, you know, those contractors are certainly gonna find which, you know, do the, do the, do the economics on it and with a fine tooth comb to come up with the the most cost-effective price per cubic yard because the, the sand capping project costs um, are pretty much completely driven by that price per cubic yard for the applied sand. Um, while it, you know, like I, I based, so that cost the mid $30 million range is based upon, you know, half a million cubic yards of sand and that's two foot of sand. If you wanted to fill that whole area up, which you know, would be great to do, you know, if you could fill it right back to what it was in the 1940s, um, you're talking about tremendous quantities of sand, you know, over three million, you know, or more like three million cubic yards of sand instead of 500,000 cubic yards of sand, which again, the, you, you're gonna take that price and probably put it up into the, you know, $70 million range to do that. Um, you know, it's, it's certainly, it, 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 can, it can be done. Um, what we were thinking in terms of a, of a future design would be to <clears throat> bring up the SAM depth 
uh, where we can, and then strategically fill some of those. You know, when, you, when I showed you the uh, bathymetry survey, there was a few locations where there was some very specific, you know, deep blue holes. Um, you know, kind of fill those where you'd get you'd get a, a much more a thicker sand uh, fill in those areas. Um, and then a, a, a variability in sand cap throughout. And yet and we've also been talking about the concept of the sand cap thickness could also potentially be looked at um, in combination with some of the work that FIT is doing to, to look at, okay, well, where's, where's the greatest flux locations um, in terms of nitrogen and phosphorus flux? Because if the goal is to mitigate nitrogen and phosphorus flux, where can we get our best bang for our buck? And if there's a, a very specific areas that have the highest nitrogen and phosphorus flux, well, maybe those are the areas that you actually thicken the cap and try to bring it up to a depth that's that's a little that's a little shallower um, and, and supportive of of a, a you know, sort of the benthic type environment. Um, so there's you know when you get into the design step, that's where you really start evaluating evaluating that. One of the things I will say is that. While some of these areas um, are deeper, you know, say the area west of the, the golf course, uh, unlike some of these places that have been looked at in terms of, okay, where you're going to have um, poor circulation and, and uh, maybe, you know, anaerobic conditions down at the, the muck interface, um, a lot of times those are sort of these smaller pits. You know, you're in a shallow, flat, you know, shallow area. The water's three, four foot deep, and then all of a sudden you got a half acre area where the water's, you know, 15 feet deep, and and you don't get any. So it's sort of a, a little a zone of stagnation in that pit. You know, when you look on the west side of the golf course, you're talking about a a, a strip of water that's you know 12 to 14 foot deep, but it's it's a mile long, and you know a quarter mile wide. So it's, it's a much bigger open water environment, um, subject to uh, you know different different forces. Um, so you know that that that'll sort of come into play as well. Um, but yeah, the sand you know the sand capping, um, you know the thickness would vary. And um, you know, like I said, we we can we can certainly look at uh, you know how much sand we bring in. I don't know, if fill, you know basically filling those areas uh, to a depth that they four or five feet would be, uh, you know, practical in terms of the volume required. All right. Thank you, Jim. Uh, we'll start with Charles. Yeah. Hey, great presentation, Jim. And I was curious, uh, when you talked about the phytoremediation, uh, that's a pretty well-known proven technology for terrestrial systems for where there's contamination. So it seems like it'd be a nice alternative. I think you, you broke up. It is on. Um, but I, look, I'll recap that, no pun intended, real quickly here, in that uh, I think the phytoremediation is a, uh, a viable technology, as it's been proven in land-based uh, scenarios. Uh, I kind of wanted to put you on the spot as to which of the technologies or alternatives you would prefer, but it sounds like you guys are letting the city commissioners come up with that on their own, so I'll refrain from that. But it looks like with that uh, approach, you know, you could create some littoral zones and kind of feeding on what Laura Lee said about, you know, creating areas for seagrasses. So I, I just really wanted to say I thought that's a positive alternative and uh, very promising. So thanks again for your presentation. <clears throat> Charlie, on my end, you're, you're breaking up so much, I don't think I can get the question understand what the question is um i don't know if there's anybody else if how that how it's coming through with the, at the public speaker location or if somebody can paraphrase um, well, it's I, all I good so just let it go <laughs> 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 he, he, he was he, he was just saying how and i don't know tim if you can get me that uh that he was you know that the work that you did was good and that he was happy that and then there was uh he was talking about the seagrass areas and the um do you want to try it one more time, Charles? Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, I just think that that approach with phytoremediation is well proven and that it might work very well here and have a lot of additional benefits. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, uh, Courtney. Um, I, I also wanted to kind of go off what Laura Lee was asking because um, <clears throat> I think the capping and this is the presentation was so good, my mind's going a mile a minute now. But, um, you know, it brings up a good point 
or Laura Lee brings up a good point. Even if we couldn't do that here with this project because cost limitations and maybe you know water depth limitations and things like that, you know it brings up a good point later on to watch how this project goes because we may have, you know, especially with sea level rise as time goes on, we may be losing seagrass areas, and this may be you know a combination approach that we could use to not only you know ad address and nutrient, you know, muck issues, but also habitat restoration and, and you know, deal with water depth issues. So what a great presentation. I mean, it's, it really brought a lot of, you know, ideas in my head. And I think, you know, as we watch this project go through, we, we, you know, depending on what your commission does, it's going to be a great resource for us to keep going back to, you know, in five, 10 years, we may be looking at this strategy normally and looking at it from a restoration standpoint. So, so great job, Cocoa Beach, and you know, great job, Jim. So thank you. All right, David. So Jim and Wayne, that's a really great presentation. So much data um, and analysis you presented. It was really fantastic. Uh, I like the way you looked at all the alternatives. We, um, are you able to hear me, um, Jim? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. So, and we just had this great presentation on muck capping that you guys referenced uh, by FIT, where it looked like muck capping might be one of the, you know, with sand, might be one of the best ways to uh, contain the nitrogen and phosphorus and prevent releaching. So that's, that's right in line with, uh, I guess, some of the latest things we've seen that were, was in highly encouraging. And, and Jim, you might be headed this way, but what are your, uh, maybe you want to expand on this, and it's already been touched on by others in the room, what are your thoughts on integrating bathymetic uh, reshaping um, to both cap the muck and reestablish um, sand bottoms, reshape contours, encourage water flow in the area, um, which then can be used to expand seagrass restoration, um, build resilience. I think one thing that hasn't been touched on as much, but should be, uh, to see level rise. Um, both the, the local property owners in the city are gonna be concerned about you know the, the sea level rise problem, which this could be part of that. Um, and it could also open up th that sort of reshaping you know, getting sand bottoms and, and expand the shores could open up uh, restoration opportunities for seagrass, clams, and oysters, uh, mangrove shoreline. You could get the students out there planting mangroves um, uh, in the next uh, part of the uh, presentation, the hands-on part, Anne. And, um, you know, maybe that could be how uh, Vard Zoo, I'm sure, would love to be a part of, you know, doing that on the, on the shoreline. But I guess it's more than long as, you know, what you've already touched on, but adding, you know, a little bit of bathymetic reshaping to this for ecological restoration, um, bringing these things together. I think it's very that, similar. That, that, that's, a, that's a great point. And um, something we'll certainly be looking at, um, assuming this, you know, if that alternative is selected and we go to, into, into design for that alternative. Because what I, you know, like, like I said, conceptually, we just assumed for alternative, if you did a two foot cap just throughout, it creates, um, you know, 25,000 square foot of, of, of sort of new habitat. Well, if you strategically design, you know, this, the placement of the sand, we can greatly increase the, um, the, the amount of, you know, sort of square footage or acreage that sort of comes up within that, that, that habitat horizon. Um, you know, and in conversations that I've had with, with Austin and others, you know, that one, one of the things we'll also be really be trying to look at is, um, you know, doing our best to, to especially the deeper areas to bring them up as much as possible because we do not want um, to have sort of, we we'll do everything we can to sort of try to eliminate anoxic zones. Um, well, that may not, you know, the, these capping projects are, have great potential. You know, they're, they're, there's that issue. You, you do want to have a, an aerobic um, environment and if you can maintain that aerobic environment, um, you know, that's, certainly is, is highly beneficial um, versus having sort of an anoxic condition. So um, we'll also, you know, as part of the design there, you'd be looking at, uh, we'd be looking at some of the wave modeling and flow modeling um, along with that through the hydrodynamics to understand um, how some of that contouring could potentially be, be done um, of the bathymetry to, to sort of help mitigate against zones of stagnation uh, where we can as well. 
Uh, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, I think there's a great opportunity here for you guys to lead the way and show what is possible with, you know, habitat restoration and, you know, uh, ensuring against uh, future problems like sea level rise and, and, and uh, really beautifully done. Thank you. I hope we get the support that you need. All right. And uh, Kimberly? Thank you, Larley. Come on. <clears throat> Um, my first question is just in regard to the actual sand, if this is the project that goes forward. Um, and you mentioned a couple different options for sourcing that sand. Uh, do one option, does one option over the other have less um, additives? Because I know when you bring in renourishment for the beaches, that there's a scrubbing agent that's attached to that. So is there data for the uh, detergents and how that would affect the water quality? Would this be just non-treated sand? Would this be coming straight from a source that would not have additives? There's no detergents. Thank you for that. Virginia has, have, it, has stated there are no detergents added to this sand. And that, so this sand would not have any additives. This would just be straight from a sand bed to the project. Excellent. Okay, great. Thank you, Virginia. And Jim, thank you for that. Great. Sorry, let me just clarify. The, the scrubbing that you're probably talking about mm -hmm. is um, a, a water wash to just separate out fines from the coarser material. Okay, so right? excellent. There's no, no chemicals. Excellent, okay, great. Um, and in regard to that, you uh, also mentioned that there are some huge variations in the depth of the muck uh, from 24 feet to just a few feet. Um, where do you see that sand naturally eroding into that canal? Um, do you see that, do you have any projections? I know you mentioned a few cutting edge sites in South Florida. Do they have some data that reflects that this is not something that has to be maintained by adding more sand yearly or, or however often that would be? Not that it would not still be a benefit because if you're looking at maintenance, uh, for muck removal that may occur anyway, but I'm curious if there's any kind of maintenance timeline that exists. Um, I don't, the, the sites in South Florida, I have not heard of any, any you know, maintenance needs associated with them or issues in terms of um, the sand not you know, performing sort of as designed. Um, similarly, where it's been applied um, unsafe you know, where sand capping has been done, you know, a lot up in the, the northeast and the Midwest on, um, you know, sort of contaminated sites where you're not dealing with, you know, nitrogen and phosphorus, you're dealing with sort of PCBs or mercury or things like that, where you truly have to make sure that the cap is in place and they do, you know, significant maintenance and monitoring of them. Um, the projects that, the, that, you know, we've been involved with, we haven't had issues where we've had to go back and, and, and add, add additional sand. Is it a possibility that if there, if there was a, a major storm event that you can get a, maybe an area where there was additional scour and, and, and get in an area of where there's, you know, say some exposed muck? Sure, it's possible. Um, but at the end of the day, putting down uh, some sand in, a, in an area, let's say, a, you know, a half acre or an acre that gets, gets some, some, you know, some large event um, causes an issue, it's, it's, it's not a big deal to, to, to go back out there and, and add some more sand to a, a given given location. Okay, because <laughs> I do believe that I heard you mention that the project estimate would go from around 35 million to uh, the same cost as the other projected plans, around 70 million or above, per yeah, adding that would be, sand yeah. initially. So that would increase the yeah, maintenance no, that cost. would be, that would be if I said it, 30, the mid 30s is what we budgeted. If you were to use two foot of sand, what I was getting at is, is if you were to try to start filling that entire area so that the bottom surface is, you know, sort of naturally what it was back in, you know, 1940. Meaning, some of those areas adding uh, 20 feet of sand or 18 feet of sand, then your volumes, you know, go go up dramatically um, from you know, a half million cubic yards of sand to millions of cubic yards of sand. And at that point, you can start seeing, you know, obviously the prices are going to go um, up significantly the more, the, the larger the volume of sand that you bring in. 
Okay, and then also, um, I did not catch what you said, but I was curious, on slide 12, I believe it was bullet point five, um, you said there was a certain contaminant that wasn't a measurable result, or if you would, please, I did not catch that, maybe it was a PFAS, that you did not have a conclusive. My question, uh, will my follow-up to that, if you want to go ahead and address that all at once, is just, again, my question prior to this presentation was the leaching into the aquifer. Um, so with sea level rise, as a couple of the other board members have mentioned, is obviously a very current issue that is affecting the lagoon now. Um, with that, is the aquifer level rising? So underneath, our, uh, our water supply is coming up. So I don't know how that would relate to leaching uh, from the sedimentation that's capped. Um, I, but do you have data on that? Do you have information? Um, do you have any information about the significance of the aquifer level coming up and how that would affect it, or is that not even an issue in this location? Well, actually, um, you know, so when you, you talk about the aquifers here, you have a superficial aquifer, which is just sort of the, the shallow groundwater that's overlying you know, when you dig a hole out in the golf course three feet down and you hit the water, that's the shallow aquifer system. <clears throat> you know, that, that's pretty constant, not changing much. The Florida aquifer system, which is our deeper aquifer system, even sort of with sea level rise, the, the head of the potentiometric surface of the Florida is actually continuing to slowly go down over time. It's not coming up, it's going down. And that's because of all the, the pumping and that's and, and used for, for water use and things like that. What we have out in the lagoon, or at the bottom, where you've got that clayey material, if anything, you actually have you, you do have some some slight leakage from the from the Florida, and that works its way up. So there's actually sort of an upward uh, movement of, of groundwater. But these, um, I, I went back to slide 12. I'm not sure if I'm presenting anymore. Um, but like I said, there was essentially, you know, nothing detected. Um, at the one location, I think it's the bullet you're referring to, 10 of the core locations we had analyzed for, for PFAS uh, constituents. Um, and there's 24 different PFAS compounds that are, that are analyzed. The two PFAS constituents, PFOS and PFOA, that the state of Florida has provisional soil cleanup target levels um, associated with those, we were well below those those values. The remaining 22 individual PFAS compounds that they don't even have provisional cleanup levels for, um, they, we did have, I think it was two or three individual PFAS constituents that were detected but that they were detected at a level that was actually less than the laboratory detection limit that they can actually quantify it as a value. So they have to they put an estimated value with a qualifier associated with the data, meaning it was between the method the, text, the method detection limit and what they can actually practically quantify. So they put a, a, a value on it. So it's basically saying, you know, there was a little, it was something detected, but it was an extremely low concentration. So one would assume that, you know, when, when or if they do have sort of criteria, screening criteria for those compounds, um, that, you know, if, if they're, they're sort of going to be um, a, a non-issue because um, we're, we're well below the provisional levels for PFOS and PFOA um, that was analyzed. And is that data available that for sharing? Or do we have access to that to see that report, or is that just in-house? Can you share that with us? I don't know um, if it's available to be public per year. No. When the alternative assessment document is finalized, which will be you know, after we um, get sort of the, after the commission meeting and document what the um, sort of the recommended alternative is going to be, we'll then be finalizing that alternative assessment report. And part of that alternative assessment report includes the, the, the tech memo that includes all the field investigation findings that, because um, we've drafted that field tech memo and it's, it's like a 1200 page um, document that's got all that information contained within it. 
Okay, so is that public? Am I able to access that report about Not yet. Course? It will, I assume it will, it will eventually be when the alternative assessment report towards the end of the year is finalized. Okay, and then... It will be provided to the... Okay, great. And the geotubes, um, I didn't know, do those, I'm familiar with the Pinetus, I, I live right there, I pass it all the time. Do those geotubes for that type of restoration stay in the earth? As, as I saw on your slides, do those geotubes remain in place after the actual project concludes? Or are those constantly filtering? Well, the, one, the, the, ones, on the, the ones on the Pinetus certainly won't because they're used over and over again. But for this golf course sort of alternative, remember we're just looking at sort of conceptual alternatives. If you were to build sort of a, a, a permanent uh, muck disposal location on the golf course and then ultimately cap over it, um, you would leave them in the, in the geotubes because they're sort of, they're, they're basically, everything remains contained within the individual geotubes. And then you basically then grade over that with um, sand and other soils to sort of create the topography over the top of that, um, potentially put a geomembrane down to, to, as a sort of a cap and then put topsoil and grass and sort of grade over and contour over it. So the geo, in, in the alternative that we developed for sort of the, call it permanent um, placement on the southern portion of the golf course and then capping those geotubes in that situation would remain um, in place. And did I hear you correctly that that would actually be a probable source of leaching if we did choose a geotube kind of concoction there to mitigate this? Over, over time, because any water that comes out of the geotube um, has elevated you know, nitrogen and phosphorus. And of course, as you add layers of geotubes and they, and they start consolidating on, on one another, you're, you're basically, you know, the water that, that does come out over, come through them um, contains elevated levels of nitrogen and phosphorus. And if, if depending on how you cap it, um, any water that, uh, say, rainfall that, that migrates or infiltrates through the cap um, that, that kind of contacts the, um, the, the muck, even if it is in geotubes, it's gonna, if those are you know, permeable, um, it would carry you know, some of the nitrogen and phosphorus with it. <clears throat> Okay, and then for the sand uh, restoration, actually put the sand, if the capping is the way that, that we chose to go, that you ended up going, um, is that equipment that would have to be purchased, those sand applicators, or is that something that the, the city has or the county has, or where does that uh, actual hard equipment that you showed us come from? Oh, that would be a, a, a contractor's bidding on the project. They okay. either rent or some of the bigger ones own that, that equipment, so they own, you know, basically, you provide them with uh, drawings and specifications, which kind of give them the guardrails in terms of what they can, the tooling they can use. And then they um, propose uh, completion of the project, you know, using their um, type of preferred equipment or rented equipment or whatever. But it's, 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 uh, it's not owned by the city, state, or county. It's, it's essentially owned by the, the yellow iron contractor that's, um, you know, installing the, the cap or doing the dredging or whatever. You know, and do you have a pool of contractors that you feel confident in this being such a new uh, project type or is there new innovation in general coming through? Yeah, we've got, and we've already reached out to, because when we were getting some of the conceptual costing and stuff, we reached out to several several contractors. Um, and a number of these contractors are, are actually out, outside the, the state of Florida because um, capping is is more widely done, say in the in the Mid Atlantic and and other locations. But a a project of sort of this this dollar size, um, you know, they would certainly um, be interested in and buying for um, an opportunity to um, you know to to bid on a project like this. And some of them are sort of like more you know national contractors that have multiple offices. They they will have an office in Florida and, and other and other places. So in evaluating bids, do you Mr. feel Chair, confident? Mr. Chair, could, could we wrap this up? This was my last question, Dr. Windsor. Thank are you. Are you sure? Um, well, I hope so. But I think these are very relevant issues that I, I think that need to be addressed. Um, you know, there's a lot of contaminants to address. And as they 
are, yes, I was addressing your comment. Um, and as these contaminants are identified, um, you know, this is a process, this is a new process, so there's going to be a lot of discovery made as well in uh, laying out this project. And as we've already mentioned, this could be a template for larger areas in the lagoon. So I think addressing the fact that these contaminants do exist and we're working around these contaminants and trying to find out what the best health perspective is for Cocoa Beach and the entire lagoon um, that I wanted to ask my last question. Um, so do you have confidence that you can choose a bid um, that will address the type of sand placement that will be best served in the lagoon and the lagoon water flux? Yeah, yeah, certainly for in terms of the, 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 the specification can be written, um, which, you know, provides the very specific guardrails in terms of how um, that um, implementation by the contractor needs to be performed to meet the specification needs and requirements of, of, the, of the project area. Okay, excellent. Thank Whether you. Whether that be related to turbidity, not not stirring up muck, you know, all these all these all these all those elements are certainly written right right into the design requirements and the technical specifications for implementation of the project. Okay, I would and ties into the environmental resource permitting that needs to go along with it. You know, that that has to be that the, the, all the permitting requirements that have to be met are also things that a contractor has to. Um, agree that they're going to meet as part of the project implementation. I would encourage you to highlight that guardrail aspect and that this last uh, response to my question that you had because that's very pertinent information um, and I think it could have even eliminated a few of my other questions, Dr. Windsor. So thank you. And my last comment is just that I know Cocoa Beach is working on a mangrove restoration project, um, very local to that site right now. Um, so I'm sure that once whatever project is uh, completed or as it's ongoing that they'll be happy to come in with mangrove restoration um, as well and different shoreline restoration as was mentioned. So that's excellent. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Okay, I have. I just have one real quick, Virginia. This the Gulf muck dredging. That's in the plan, correct? Okay. Correct. And, and so, what's going to happen, just for everybody here, is Wayne, you guys will take it back to your commission. You all will discuss the process, and then that will come forward back to us. Is that correct? Well, it's it's in the plan. It's partially funded in right. the plan, and so you know, to the extent that the city. Um, is taking the lead with this project, um, taking the lead with the design options and and seeking additional funding. Um, you know, they've, they've got a, a larger say in um, the ultimate decision than the projects that are fully funded through the half cent sales tax. Okay, great. All right. Um, Jim, Wayne, thank you all so much. As everyone said, Jim, I haven't seen five alternatives for a project like that done before. So that was that was really job well done. And, and as Wayne said, I would never be afraid to be first, not here on the Space Coast. So if it hasn't been done before, that shouldn't be a reason not to do it. So thank you all both for your presentation. Thank you, guys. Thank you for all the help, too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we'll move on, go ahead and do the next presentation, which is Dr. Fox. And uh, it is 10.15, so we do have an, an hour and 15 minutes left before we have to end the meeting. And I know it will be more lively discussion, which is good. So let's just remember we can reach out to everybody um, after the meeting if, if, there's, uh, if we have any individual questions or if we'd like to buy them lunch or, or a drink. So anyways, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Fox. Well, thank you for having me back. I guess everybody can hear me just fine. Uh, and so my talk today is a little bit different, and I guess before I jump into it, I want to applaud all of you. I really appreciate the work that you do, and you're asking some really great questions, and that's exactly what we need to make sure we're moving in the right direction. So, so thank you for that. And then I also want to applaud Jim Labinguth and Geosyntech. They've been very responsive to my comments, and so I just my final comment on that is I think we need to be do everything we can to make sure we have a successful project, right? And so. so if it costs a little bit more to have a successful project, I think we need to, to fight for those funds. And uh, just, I think the worst thing we could do is do something that wasn't the right solution. So, um, so again, thank you for having me. And I guess I was asked to come back and talk about a little bit more about our ocean inflow project. And I, and I want to pitch this in the perspective of um, 
history and then talk about how we can use what we're learning to think about some other processes in the lagoon. And so what, we've, what I'm talking about here is how changes in temperature, how changes in salinity, and how changes in dissolved oxygen will influence nutrient geochemistry. So just nutrient cycling in the lagoon. And those apply to something like an ocean inflow project. They apply to when we start to think about changing temperature in the region, right? These are things we need to think about. And so we can use this information to say, what can we expect moving to the future with or without these kinds of projects? And so I guess the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is just, I want you to imagine kind of the first time you ever saw the lagoon, right? And that, that picture is kind of burned into your head as to what the lagoon is. And for most of us, we picture the lagoon kind of as it is today, right? There's a golf course, we have houses, we have canals. Uh, but if we move back in history, the lagoon looks quite different. And so um, what you're looking at here, this is Sebastian Inlet. So this is from the Sebastian Inlet District. And you're seeing a flood shoal forming, right? Massive quantities of sand moving in through that inlet, filling in the lagoon slowly over time. And so. Uh, historically, it's a really dynamic system. So this is a picture from 1941, right? This is looking at kind of the placement of Sebastian Inlet, but in fact, it's not there, right? If you look at historical maps, in 1885, Sebastian Inlet didn't appear on the Brevard County maps. And these inlets have moved around, and in fact, on these maps without Sebastian Inlet, you can tell that there was an inlet in the region because you can see these flood shoals, right? So you see the kind of flood shoal islands that are behind it. And anywhere in the lagoon that you see these flood shoals, it's a pretty clear indication that at some point in history, there was a inlet in that region. So Cocoa Beach, right? Cocoa Beach, the, any of the wide bits in the lagoon are places where we've had historical inlets, right? So the Cocoa Beach, the Thousand Islands, those are old flood shoals that have came in over distant, in the distant past. Uh, the skinny bits of the lagoon, right? You go up to Patrick Air Force Base, you go into the ocean, you stub your toe, right? You kick the underlying coquina. It's the underlying coquina is intact. We haven't had inlets in those regions in the last several thousand years. And so I'm just painting this kind of historical picture to talk about we've had opening and closing of inlets, bringing in flood shoals. And one of the really important things that happened in the past was bringing in of new sediments, right? So by stabilizing inlets, by doing some of the things that we've done with infrastructure, we've turned off the tap of new sand coming into the lagoon, which is really appropriate when we're talking about trying to find sand to bring into the lagoon, right? Um, and so because we've stabilized the inlet, I showed you the flood shoal from the 1950s, that's still forming, right? Today, every single year, we pump out 20,000 cubic yards of sand from the lagoon back into the ocean. We pump it onto the, the leeward um, beaches, so there's a use for it. But just interesting that humans, right, part of the development that we've done is actually stopping the inflow of sand to the lagoon. And this has some really important functions, right? So these wetlands. So we've decided we wanted to live in Florida, and maybe we shouldn't have made that decision, I don't know. And we didn't like the mosquitoes that were here. And so we took these wetlands that served very important ecosystem functions, right? They're places where we have oxygen environments, right? Mud, watery mud at the surface, lots of denitrification occurring, right? Lots of absorption of phosphorus. These, these flood shoals, these uh, wetlands, were eventually, with the moving of those inlets, buried, right? When Jim's talking about that fine-grained, organic rich, or that clay that's 15 feet deep, that's naturally, I've, it's not muck, right? But it is natural, organic rich material that was coming into this system long before humans were ever here. It accumulated in the low energy environments in between these islands, right? So if you go out in between any islands today, you find muck, right? If you went out 10,000 years ago, you would find organic rich material. That's where it accumulated, right? We've dramatically increased the rate that it's coming in, but we haven't increased the amount of low energy environments. And so where I'm headed is we have these low energy environments historically. We have new flood shoals forming, naturally burying this stuff, right? 10,000 years ago, we had capping. That's exactly what happened before we removed the cap to build something like a golf course. Um, and then just other things, right? Moving forward in time, 1922, we decided we wanted to drain the St. John's uh, marshes to plant crops. So we did that. We built the C1 Canal. We've built canals all up and down the watershed to the Indian River Lagoon. And so in 2016, the rediversion project C1 Canal, we're moving 30 billion gallons per year back to the St. John's River. Right? 
And that's a really great thing to do, but between 1922 and 2016, we were bringing in the fine-grained sediments, the nutrients, the organics, to the lagoon. And so these have accumulated, right? We massively increased the amount of material coming in. We stopped the input of the coarse sand that was burying it in those fine grain, in those low energy environments. And so we've dramatically changed the system, right? And so even the system that you first saw was, was different from what it was before human development. And so I like to think of the uh, lagoon kind of as, a sec as being exposed to secondhand smoke, right? We forced cigarettes on it. And so when we talk about things like septic to sewer conversions, we're talking about taking away the cigarettes, right? Ta taking away the things that humans have added. And the impacts of doing all of that aren't immediate, right? You take up smoking, you don't see the illnesses develop for a long time. And so we're starting to get to a point in history where we're seeing those illnesses, and now all of a sudden taking away the cigarettes, right, taking away the sources is not enough to fix it, right? So we have to do things like just examples, dredging, capping. And so other things just to think about when we're talking about the development is we have few sub-basins historically, right? We didn't have causeways. We had the low energy environments were all between these flood shoals in the wetlands. And so we've added causeways, right? We've added these things that restrict circulation. And if, if in fact, if you look at the muck deposits throughout the lagoon, they all tend to be in these low energy environments. And so you can view that how you want, but we have fundamentally changed the lagoon. Right. And so one of the things that we talk about, and for some reason scientists love 1950, we always want to go back to 1950s. And I'm just, I don't think we're ever going to go back to pre-1950s condition. And so we've seen fundamental changes to circulation, right? We've seen fundamental changes to the sediments that are coming in. We're seeing more fine grain sediments coming in. We've turned off the tap to those coarse grains. Um, and we've seen wetlands converted to upland dredge spoil lines, right? If you look at Cocoa Beach, and so this is a picture of Cocoa Beach in, I believe, the 60s, and this is Cocoa Beach now. You can see it looks a lot different, and if you zoom in on those islands, the, the natural islands, right, they're all upland spoil now. We've done some restoration and protected some of them, but the function has changed dramatically, right? The nutrient removal of these areas has dramatically decreased since kind of pre pre-development period. And so technology, right? I think approaching restoration using technology is something we absolutely have to take advantage of. Water quality has decreased enough that just planting seagrasses, planting oysters, they're fantastic things to do. We need to do those, but they're going to be much more successful if we pair them with things like dredging, things like capping, and take into account some other processes. And it's funny because when I first started thinking about capping, I thought of it as this really kind of anthropogenic thing, this thing that we were going to do. But we're really just mimicking the natural process that happen in the lagoon, right? We accumulate fines in these low energy environments. We have flood trolls come and bury it. That's happening over time. And the lagoon, I've talked a lot with, about, with geologists about the morphology of the lagoon over time. I said, is it filling in, right? And if we the lagoon would be filling in over time, right? We're forming these, these flood shoals. Eventually, the lagoon would be getting smaller and smaller, burying that mud. And if you look at the morphology of just about any barrier island system, there is mud that accumulates on the, on the ocean side barrier island, right? And so just an interesting thought as we move through this. And then because we've stopped the formation of flood shoals, right? We've stopped the formation of new low energy environments. Dredging may be a valuable way to keep some of those low energy environments open so that they continue to accumulate that material. That yes, we're putting some in, but there's natural fine grain material and organic rich material coming in no matter how much we remove of, of the anthropogenic inputs. And so I think both dredging and capping can in some ways be considered as mimicking natural, natural processes. And so others, right? I mentioned ocean inflow. And so talking about the ocean inflow, I just, one of the things that they don't talk about much or that you don't hear much about is that change in sand, right? Because we're saying we're kind of restoring natural processes. And I think the sand is something really important to think about. But ocean inflow, right? That's something that we might want to consider um, looking at. And so the idea for it really developed from if you talk to the public, I hear all the time, let's build a new inlet, right? And you've all been to an inlet, you go, you see the water, it looks crystal clear, you're like this is wonderful, you move a mile north, and the water quality is terrible. And so how can we take that 
those impacts and spread it over a larger area. And so I'm going to direct you down to my little picture here. Tides come in, water comes in through those inlets, brings clean ocean water. It mixes with the lagoon, right? Tide goes down. We have this mixed ocean water, lagoon water leaving, taking with it particles, taking with it nutrients, and helping to have that better water quality in those areas. And so flushing, right? And so I guess these inlets do discharge materials from the lagoon into the coastal ocean, right? That's a natural process. And so how can we spread this over a larger area, the impacts of that inlet? How can we spread the benefits of that seawater exchange over larger areas? And we can do that by pumping water in in one location and requiring or just allowing water in in one location, and it has to go out somewhere else, right? So now we can make that water spread throughout the lagoon or traverse the lagoon before leaving and have some of the benefits spread over a larger area. And so there are examples of this, right? Destin Harbor, so they did a project, slightly different reasonings, a much smaller area, but they've had success in improving water clarity, uh, stabilizing salinity, and improving DO, right? So they pump it, they run it primarily during the summer, which as you'll see in just a second, that's kind of what I would recommend if we were to do, consider something like this. Um, but there are examples of successful projects, right? And then if you look in the literature for just improving circulation, right, lakes, uh, estuaries, all over the world we're seeing examples of places where improving circulation can help to improve water quality. But we do see kind of system-specific responses, right? And so it's something worth considering. We don't want to just jump all in with it. And so geochemical responses to inflow. One of the things, my big question to this is, are, is there a reason other than dilution, right? Just diluting it with seawater, that shouldn't be what we're trying to do, right? Is there a reason other than simple dilution that uh, ocean inflow might work? And the kind of working hypothesis is that small improvements to water quality using something like ocean inflow, right? We can improve water quality in many ways, but we might have nonlinear restoration trajectories. And that's a fancy way of saying that if we just make small improvements, we can shift the nitrogen from something like ammonia to nitrate. Right, to, species, to different species that favor kind of beneficial photosynthesizers, favor things like seagrasses versus a picosanobacteria like Oreoumbra. Um, and so we can do this because one of the reasons that ocean inflow might contribute to this. I'm sorry, Austin, the, the public has lost audio. Logan, Logan in the sky. <laughs> Is there some magic button you can push to restore audio for the meeting? So Logan has left, but his um, uh, Jesse is upstairs. Jesse, if you could uh, try to get the audio back. And it looks like Lou texted me and said they weren't. Yeah, I'm getting my <laughs> text. <laughs> Let's see. And we'll just try a couple minutes, try, Dr. Yeah. Fox, and then if not, we'll just uh, move forward. Okay since we do have a quorum. Um, and this will be recorded, so they could catch it later, but let, let's see. Does my mic work? Yeah. I don't think, I think it's any of us. Oh. So, it's, for, for people watching virtually, it's showing that your mic is muted. So maybe it's just um, the mic control room, or Alex, do, do we still have that? box up there with the green oh we do but it's I, lit there we go i unmuted myself fantastic so could they hear me at the beginning hopefully yeah they could okay. hear you until a couple yeah minutes ago okay so everybody at home can hear me now let's see hold on lou let us know text me if you can hear or someone keep talking Okay, I'll no. keep talking. Okay. Dr. Fox, if you want to join me in a song. <laughs> okay, good. I got an okay. All right. Okay, good. No, good. I threatened to oh. sing. Threatened to sing, and everybody's like, we can hear, we can hear. All right, thank you. Okay. And, and so it's well established that cooler water decreases bacterial metabolism and can decrease fluxes both from the sediments and within the water column, right? I've got it. Okay. Um, and so... If we look at the turnover of nutrients in seawater, 
it's much lower. We're seeing three times lower turnover, and I'll get to that in a second, of nutrients in seawater versus lagoon water. And so by bringing in that seawater with lower rates of nutrient turnover, we can have a pretty Im significant impact on the speciation of nutrients and the total um, cycling of it, and hopefully favor putting some of it back into the sediments. And finally, stabilizing DO, as hopefully you'll remember from last time, can be extremely important in sequestering phosphorus in sediments and promoting that coupled nitrification, denitrification. And again, these are some of the reasons that something like a cap will work. And so that's one of the big pictures as to why we need to be very careful when we think about placing a cap. Um, and so how do we address these questions before we even do a pilot? Right? So we're talking about considering something like ocean inflow that's, again, going to change temperature, maybe change salinity, uh, and help to stabilize DO. And we do that by looking at kind of the historical data sets. We can look at data that's out there. And then we can take samples uh, and do some field experiments. And so one of the really cool things that this project did is when we think about restoration of the lagoon, we're focused so much on muck that all of our data has been for muck. And so this project has allowed me to go into sand and say, if we're bringing in cleaner water, we're going to start to, to influence the 90% of the lagoon bottom that's actually sand covered. Right? And so we can take advantage of that huge surface area of sand to try to help restore the lagoon. And so we have some data now for sand fluxes. And so the other way we do this, we go collect cores, bring them back into the lab, and we do laboratory experiments. Right? We can control for temperature. We can control for dissolved oxygen. And so we can test for how changes to one of these variables will influence the nutrient cycling over time. And so you can't really see much through our, through our uh, insulated water bath. So I give you the schematic. Basically, we're able to control for all of these variables while measuring nutrient fluxes and oxygen fluxes over time. And so looking at some of the data, if you've seen data for the flux of nitrogen from mud, right, it's always positive, and it's virtually all ammonia. And so when we look at the sand, you're seeing that roughly half of the fluxes are positive, roughly half are negative. And we can explain this based on the oxic conditions of the sediments, as you'll see in just a second. Right? If you think back to what you saw for phosphorus, I'm going to reflect on that in a second. When we have oxygen in the system, we're helping to the sediments help to convert that ammonia to something like nitrogen or nitrate. And so when I show the nitrate fluxes, where you see a positive nitrate flux, you're likely seeing a negative ammonia flux, right? and vice versa. And so then to show you the phosphorus fluxes, and so these are from sandy sites throughout the lagoon, we're seeing again a mix of positive and negative fluxes, and these are largely a function of oxygen, but because these are in the actual environment, these have variations as a function of temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, and other environmental variables. And so we now have all this information for just what the fluxes are in those sandy sediments, again, 90% of the lagoon bottom. And now we start to consider the oxygen. And so you're going to hear me talk a lot about oxygen today. And these are, uh, this, is mon this is tracking dissolved oxygen in the lagoon, right? and that's that kind of yellowish line. And then behind it, you see a line for dissolved oxygen in the ocean just on the other side of the locks. And so I want to point out midnight on two days. Right? And so this is a 24-hour cycle. And what we're seeing is the diurnal cycling. Right? The sun comes up, algae make oxygen. The sun goes down, the algae consume oxygen. And what you're seeing, oh, go forward, is the oxygen goes up in the lagoon. We're seeing this 4 or 5 milligram per liter increase in dissolved oxygen during the day and then a roughly equal decrease at night. We're seeing a, a fluctuation of oxygen on the order of four, five, six milligrams per liter every single day. And that makes the system really susceptible to, to, to oxygen events. If you look at the ocean side, right, we're seeing fluctuations only going up by maybe a milligram per liter during the day and going down by maybe a milligram per liter at night. And that much smaller variance in the oxygen day to day makes it much more resilient to things like hypoxic events. And I'm going to touch on that again in just a second. So that's how oxygen is important to thinking about these fluxes. If we now consider this is temperature in the lagoon and in the port, and you'll notice that in the summertime, the lagoon tends to be a, a degree or two warmer than the adjacent ocean. Right? And so if we think about bringing in ocean water, we can, lead, we can end up cooling the lagoon by just a little tiny bit. The other really cool thing to point out is in the winter, the lagoon has a much smaller thermal mass, and it actually gets cooler than the adjacent ocean. 
And so even though fluxes, right, if we want to decrease the input of nitrogen and phosphorus, we might consider pumping during the warm summer months. But if we think about cold events in the lagoon, right, if you have a system in place to bring during winter maybe warm ocean water in, we can maybe start to think about mitigating some of these extreme cold events, like if we had something like this in place in 2009, 2010, right, we could have maybe at least created a warm water refuge of some kind. And so, so there are many ways that you could use something like this pump. I'm here again today focused on the geochemistry. I'm simply saying, is this something that might work in terms of nutrients, right? I'm not trying to comment on anything else. There are lots of other things that we need to consider. Um, and so you saw this last time, but just want to reflect on the importance of the dissolved oxygen. And so I can put, this is dissolved oxygen from a St. John sensor in the Banana River Lagoon. And again, showing you, so you saw kind of those graphs with just all the data points. Now this is a single site over time. And you can see that where we have oxygen, and so where the oxygen is positive or above zero, we're seeing more, more or less fluxes of phosphorus from the overlying water into the sediments. These sandy sediments are actually acting as a sink for dissolved phosphorus. Right? During this hypoxic event, we see a large release of phosphorus from the sediments into the overlying water, right? So anaerobic sediments act as a source of phosphorus to the overlying water. And then what I showed you last time was that this point didn't really match a hypoxic event, right? When we were looking at those mid-water uh, dissolved oxygen sensors. And so fortunately we had deployed a sensor, we learned that there was in fact a hypoxic event at this site, and we did see a corresponding phosphorus, a positive phosphorus flux. And so really cool information that we can get by tracking dissolved oxygen. Um, and so those anaerobic events are really important. And so that's what we saw in the field, but now we can bring those, bring sediment cores back into the lab, we can control for temperature, we can control for salinity, and get some, some empirical data to be able to make estimates as to how much phosphorus might we prevent from entering the lagoon if we increase and stabilize dissolved oxygen. And I didn't really get into the data, I just want to show you that in fact we do reproduce what we see in the field. If we have higher dissolved oxygen, the sediments on average act as a sink for dissolved phosphorus. When we go to anaerobic conditions, we do release large pulses uh, of phosphate. And there's a little bit of noise in these graphs because it's so sensitive to when the system went hypoxic, how long it's been hypoxic, and then when was the last time it went hypoxic, right? So if it released all of the phosphorus the day before, and then I make it go anaerobic again, it has less phosphorus to release. And so even though we can control for it, there's still a little bit of noise in the data. So temperature, so we're really excited being wor now working in sand. We have lots of data for the effect of temperature on bacterial metabolism for, for mud. But when we move into the sand, you can see that we go from at low temperatures, kind of the lowest temperatures normally experienced in the lagoon, very low phosphorus fluxes, and we increase with increasing temperature. And so th these data are really valuable if we think about increasing lagoon temperatures over time. And it also is valuable if we think about potentially decreasing lagoon temperature with something like inflow. And so I spent a lot of time thinking about sediment fluxes, but one of the things that, that this project also led to is starting to think about the water column processes. There's so many algae in lagoon water that we have really high rates of respiration, really high fluxes from the particles that are, that are floating around in the water column. And so what you're looking at here is some chambers, right? We take the same benthic chamber, we just don't put any sediments in it, and we measure the decrease in oxygen over time and the increase in dissolved nutrients over time. We do all of these in the dark, just because then we're controlling for photosynthesis. And big picture is if we take the median lagoon respiration rate, we get somewhere around 0.2 milligrams per liter per hour. And so if we think about that over a 12-hour dark cycle, right, the median decrease in dissolved oxygen in the lagoon is somewhere between 2 and 3 milligrams per liter um, every single night. Right? And what that means is we have these large fluctuations. It doesn't take all that much to knock it down into something like a hypoxic event. And that's the median, right? 50% of the time, it's larger than that number. When we go into the ocean, 0.1 milligram per liter per hour, and so the median, again, over 12 hour period is roughly 1.2 milligrams per liter decrease at night, and that corresponds roughly to what we saw in that graph earlier. And so if you kind of take our, our experimental data here and plug it in, it fits into that kind of long-term tracking pretty well. 
And then we can take this long-term tracking and look over longer periods of time, right? And in fact, you see the ocean is pretty resilient. It has pretty small diurnal fluctuations, but the lagoon has those larger fluctuations. It doesn't take all that much to cause it to slip into some hypoxic event. And so in this picture, right, February 7th, February 8th, and I want you to remember that date, we had a fish kill in this region. Right, we went up there, we saw dead fish, and, and I like to point out, I think a lot about the sediments. I see dead fish, I see dead crabs, I see dead whelk, right? It's not just the fish. Um, and so oxygen is so important in controlling the nutrients, and I just don't have time to show you all the nutrient fluxes associated with the particles, but the nutrient fluxes are proportional to the respiration, right? We have nutrient cycling in the lagoon that's being taken up by algae and being released, going back into algae three times faster or more than we're seeing in the adjacent ocean, right? And so mixing in a little bit of ocean water can help to decrease that rate of turnover for nutrients. And so this is an oversimplification, but do any of you remember February 8th? Vinny's like, yeah, it was a cloudy I'm day. Always remember it, I'm there. <laughs> and so because we have a such large cycle, right? If, if we're at, just look at that and say we're at eight milligrams per liter on February 7th, and we have an, a four or five milligram per liter cycle every day, if we just don't go back up one day, right? We go down by four, we don't go up the next day, we go down by four again, we end up hypoxic. And this is really cool. So this is data from Weather Underground. February 8th was a cloudy day. Right? We had much lower light intensity than we had the previous days. And in the lagoon, with that large diurnal fluctuation, we see a crash in oxygen. This is kind of a perfect scenario. Right? It's much more complicated than just cloud cover. But this is just a perfect example of the importance of, of something like light and how that large diurnal, diurnal fluctuation can be of importance in lagoon health. And so tracking oxygen can be really important to understanding uh, what's happening in the lagoon. And so now we have data for, for sediments, we have data for water. How important is the water relative to, to these sandy sediments? And so if we look at differing depths, right, as the water gets deeper, we have more water, and so the water becomes more important to the overall uh, respiration. And so if in a shallow lagoon, right, the sediments can account for 50% of the total respiration. That's pretty important. That's sand, right? If we go into mud, all of a sudden we can be 50, 80, 90% of the total respiration in shallow environments. When we get to kind of the average depth of the lagoon, sand is accounting for about a quarter, about 25% of the total respiration. And so no matter how we slice it, sediments are really important right, to understanding lagoon health. And so um, water column processes right, are really important to consider. And so, so bringing in little bits of water that is clear, lower turnover times for nutrients, hypothetically has the ability to at least help the nutrients scenario, right? And so, again, trying to cram a whole lot of information into, into a fifth, well, probably gone over 15 minutes now. Um, it's, we've learned that the lagoon is a really dynamic system and it's fundamentally changed since the early 1900s. I think that's a really important point when we try to talk about changing things, right? We, we don't want to change inputs of, or changes in salinity, we don't want to change salinity, but we've done that in the past, right? The, the lagoon that we all know now is the result of changes we made hundreds of years ago. And so I think we need to at least be re uh, accepting that things aren't going to stay the same forever. Um, and so with respect to ocean inflow, it's been kind of a mixed in, the, in this talk. Um, inflow is expected to stabilize salinity, right? So the ocean salinity is typically around 35 parts per thousand. Lagoon salinity varies from, it's all over the place. So typically it's probably slightly lower than the 35. But we expect to see a slight increase from the current average, yet the value would be within the natural range experienced in the area. A decrease in temperature, we expect to see a decrease in temperature that's much less than one degree Celsius, so very small change. But that very small change over huge areas of the lagoon can actually be really dramatic in terms of reducing inputs of nitrogen and phosphorus. And so I just like to point out that all of the changes are within what's seen in the lagoon anyways. 
And so the pilot project that's proposed is a half a cubic meter per second. And if we brought in half a cubic meter per second using some of the data we've gathered through this process, uh, again, very small changes in temperature, we're expecting to see 1.6 tons decreased fluxes of phosphorus nitrogen and 0.7 tons decreased fluxes of phosphorus are up to those values with just this very small project. And we expect those to more or less scale with the volume of inflow. Um, and so I can talk about why we've proposed this small pilot and all of that stuff, uh, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about the data and the cool things we've learned about the lagoon in the process. Um, and again, can't emphasize enough that stabilizing DO with less frequent hypoxic events can change the storage of phosphorus in sediments and promote that coupled nitrification, denitrification. And so lower rates of, rates of respiration, race, blah, 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 lower rates of respiration in seawater, those particle fluxes, is a really important thing to consider uh, when we think about um, something like ocean inflow. And the decrease in nitrogen and phosphorus from those fluxes can be several tons, even with this small project. And so um, just my final thought here is that if you look at kind of the HAB literature, one of the key things in driving or, or triggering HABs is, is long residence times for water. And so just adding that extra circulation itself can, al can also help to mitigate HABs. And so with that, I mean, it's kind of a scattered talk, but um, thank you very much. I really appreciate you guys being here and listening to me. I thank the other researchers here uh, at Florida Tech that have looked into this project, and then some technicians and, and students that have been really helpful in, in gathering this data, So and then also our funding agencies. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Do we have any questions? No. Nope. Nope. David? Yeah, I guess uh, just some quick questions. Um, so a half meter per second. Uh, how much net flow is that? That's the amount of net flow that you're modeling these so, results on? So the half a cubic meter per second yeah. is a little bit bigger. So if you imagine the amount of water that comes through a dredge pipe now, it's probably about double that volume of water. So not huge volumes. And the idea is we'd be able to have a, a pilot test in a small area of the lagoon. And so we can actually measure, do the things that we're seeing in the lab, do they scale up, right? Do they actually happen in the real world? So it allows us to test, test those things in the real world and then build models to test if we were to build a larger scale project, how it works. And so did that? Yeah, it, it seems like not that much flow uh, to produce any sort of net change and in so a large lagoon system like that, you know, uh, was, was, I guess, part of my thought. and. Have you looked at what the unintended biological consequences of something like this might be? Is there any modeling on how you know this could infect, affect the uh, the biological environment around the area? So, the half cubic meter per second is very small, and it's not intended to have a huge impact on the lagoon. It's intended to be a pilot study to just prove out what we've seen in the lab, make sure that it translates to the lagoon. And from my perspective, I'm just viewing this as, does it work for nutrients, right? If, it, if bringing in ocean water wouldn't improve the nutrient conditions, then there's no reason to do it, and then we don't need to worry about these adverse impacts. Um, I am not the biologist. There are biologists working on this project, looking at the infauna and looking at the fish. And so there's a fish model, and Jeff Abel talked about that, I guess, last month briefly. and. Yes, there can be impacts to, to biota. I don't want to go into them because I'm not a biologist and I'll say something wrong. But I think the key thing to emphasize is that any changes from pretty much any volume of pumping would be within the ranges of temperature salinity that are naturally experienced in the lagoon anyways. And so you might see one area becoming slightly different than it was in the recent past, but that area has experienced changes within this range naturally over time. How would you compare this to just reducing pollution sources? You know, there's the old saying, dilution is not the solution to pollution. I mean, when you look at doing something like bringing in this additional flow versus looking at ways to reduce the pollution that's, you know, coming into the system or that's in the system, how would you compare and contrast those 
so I opportunities. Absolutely agree that we don't want to just be pumping things out into the open ocean. And so that's one of the reasons for looking at all the things we're looking at, right? We can promote these ecosystem services. So if we improve water quality just a little bit, we can promote the coupled nitrification, denitrification, right? So that's actually removing nitrogen from the system into the atmosphere. And so we're pumping in some seawater, but the nutrients that you, people think would be moving south, some of those are actually being removed into the atmosphere before it ever makes it south, right? And so we're taking advantage of the massive area of sand in the lagoon to, to just help restore some of the natural processes that would remove the nitrogen phosphorus anyways. And so I've tried to come up with analogies, but it's kind of like you drive your car and you wouldn't put the tailpipe in the window, right? So that's kind of what we're doing with the lagoon, but by spreading it out a little bit, the impacts are mitigated. And so, so I don't like dilution, just that dilution fact, but a little bit of dilution can actually improve the whole system to the point where it can then naturally restore some of those ecosystem services and help to get rid of it. I guess okay. one last question that kind of tails into an earlier presentation we had, which is uh, that's not a large amount of flux to come in. You talked about the benefits of stabilizing dissolved oxygen from this small amount of flow. Why then do we not see good results with that low of a flow? It's going to get a change in dissolved oxygen with with aerators, right? If we put in these large, you know, aerator systems that, um, whether they're motor driven, bubble driven, whatever, why do we not see positive results from that? But a small amount of inflow is going to make a difference in the dissolved oxygen. Fantastic question. So <laughs> again, the small amount of inflow is just designed to treat a small area so that we can test whether it's a good solution for the for the broader lagoon. And aeration, it, it, I struggled with this for a long time, right? We, we tested it because we thought it might work. And aeration is adding oxygen to a system that has a problem. We haven't addressed the underlying problem in the first place, right? So bringing in the seawater and decreasing the turnover time of nutrients, that's actually helping to solve the underlying problem. And so if we add oxygen, right, through aerators, one of the things that's happening, if if the sediments are not recovering enough to carry out those ecosystem services, but we're adding oxygen. We help to break down algae, release the nutrients, new algae take it up, make new algae, right? And it just accelerates this cycle, but we aren't actually going anywhere. We're not getting enough oxygen in the system to help the, help the sediments. And so the idea here is that we can address the underlying problem of the turnover time, right, that, that water column respiration, and that sediment respiration to shift the system in a direction that supports naturally healthier oxygen conditions, right? And so it's not the oxygen, we're not bringing in oxygen from the ocean into the lagoon. There's a little bit, but we're bringing in that cleaner water that uses less oxygen. It's more stable. Um, I know it's kind of a twisty answer, but. Just because you're removing the amount of um, existing algae and dissolved organics and things with this? I mean, what if you did your aerator as a protein skimmer? So I think the scale of the system has to be taken into account. Again, I think okay. a protein skimmer, it's, it may have some value. I've, I've thought a lot about that. Um, something may be worth looking into. But, right. but it's a large lagoon. So when you start to scale <laughs> these things, uh, yeah. the inflow is hypothetically can be scaled relatively easily. This protein skimmer, so I've thought about that, and I start to calculate how long it would take to cycle volumes of, of the lagoon, and it's pretty hard to believe uh, how long it takes. All right, uh, any other questions for Dr. Fox Kimberly? Yes. We, like the source in the ocean, is it in the canal, is it in the Grand Canal, or excuse me, the Barge Canal? So at present, the proposed source of water is from in Port Canaveral. And would that water be tested just because I know there's so many contaminants that come off of the boats and fuels and different oils that are in that leached out? Would that water be tested prior or filtered or both before putting it straight into the lagoon? So again, I'm looking at the nutrients, and so I would be okay. tracking the nutrients coming in. Uh, and I guess it depends on permitting and all of those things, whether or not the, the water needs to be tested, because I think there are people keeping track of water quality in the port. And so one of the, one of the things to consider in the port is many of the organic contaminants coming in from um, 
industry are float, right? Oil floats on water. And so one of the ways that we're getting around having to worry about that is by taking water from, from just below the sort of bottom. Okay, so that's obviously something that you use that has been addressed in the project plan. Yeah. It's very promising. And so if this pilot goes well and all results are positive and confirm what your um, best outcome would be, what then will you do with that? Is how is how What are your plans to expand this or to create a larger program? So, so myself, I do all this because I love the lagoon and I want to help find solutions, right? Okay. And so I want to test and see if it works. And at that mm -hmm. point, I would just be able to come to places like this and come to, to uh, agencies and say, I think that the research that we've done suggests that this is something that we might want to consider doing. Because it could be done on a large scale, but that's probably not something I'd really be involved in other than tracking some of the changes. OK, thank you. All right, uh, Dr. Fox, thank you for that presentation. That was awesome. And I think our next presenter is Dr. Fox. All right. Um, so. The final presentation of the day uh, is a, a Lagoon success story, story of oxygen, right? Yeah. And so thank you again for having me. And you can, you can <laughs> probably tell that I think oxygen is this really important variable. And if I had to choose a single water quality variable to track, it would absolutely be oxygen. We can learn so much from it. And uh, what you're looking at here is data from our growing network of dissolved oxygen sensors placed throughout the lagoon. And so we're going to talk a little bit about those sensors uh, right now. And so oxygen, it's really, really important in the lagoon, and there are existing data out there, right? So on, on your right, you're seeing the St. John's River Water Management District network of sensors, and the little numbers next to each one is the depth at which those sensors are placed. So this is depth below the surface. And those are somewhere in the range of 1.5 to 1.9 meters, so 1.5 to roughly 2 meters. And so they're placed somewhere in the middle of the water column. So the figure on the left, or to the left of that, is Orca. So we have these Orca Kilroys out there, and their water depths range somewhere between 1.4 and 1.9 meters. And obviously these vary a little bit with changes in lagoon level. And so there's some really cool information that we can gather from these existing networks of dissolved oxygen. They give a great general picture of what's happening in the water column. And so if we want to think about kind of the nutrient cycling happening in, in the general water column, they, they're great. And these existing networks, you can go online right now. I think, have all of you looked at these data? You can go on light right now and see what the oxygen is today. And there can be some really good value to that, right? Especially if we have the ability to respond. So if we had some way, right, we see that the oxygen is crashing, we have aerators available, we can go throw them in a canal and prevent um, and help to mitigate or prevent a fish kill. That's a really cool use of real-time data. Um, and so I've, through the research we've done, we've decided or we've identified this need to look at oxygen at the bottom, right? The geochemistry that's controlling nutrient cycling is happening primarily at the bottom of the lagoon and at that sediment water interface. And if you think about the sediments consuming large quantities of oxygen, right? We saw that the sediments consume sandy sediments consume 25 to 50 percent of the oxygen in the whole water column, and that's all happening at that interface, right? So if you look at the lagoon, we have oxygen coming in at the surface, oxygen being consumed at the bottom, and in many cases, oxygen behaves very nicely. It's this nice vertical profile. In many ca other cases, right, we see oxygen depleted or, or lower when we go to the bottom. And so I've, through that flushing project, starting to try to understand the sand, we've, that we were able to start this, jumpstart this network. Um, and so I've deployed bottom water sensors. The little colored dots there show where we have sensors or have had sensors. Um, and these sensors give us some really good information to understand the geochemistry and nutrient fluxes that hopefully you can start to have an idea of the importance of those. They're also really important to thinking about benthic fauna, right? If we look at the dissolved oxygen in the middle of the water column, it's, yes, it's giving us a picture of kind of the water column processes, but if the sediments went anoxic, all of the benthic fauna, right, they're going to suffer those consequences. And we may never even see that that happened. And you saw that a little bit in the in this slides earlier. Um, and then other things that we can use this data for is determining the suitability for restoration. Right? If we want to cap an area, right, is it a place that we're going to have enough oxygen to cap in situ? Right? If we don't bring that, the sediment level up, 
is, are we likely to have oxygen in that place after capping? Is a cap likely to be successful? Also, if we want to plant oysters, right? If we can tell you that there's no oxygen at the bottom, it's probably not the best place to build an oyster reef. Um, and then evaluating successive projects, right? So if we do a capping project, one of the goals is to decrease, or the goal, I think, is to decrease nutrient fluxes. And those fluxes are proportional to that oxygen consumption, right? And so by tracking dissolved oxygen, we can get a really good snapshot of, of whether a project was successful. And then we can supplement that with kind of sampling of nitrogen and phosphorus. And so one of the differences about the existing networks and ours is we are continuous. So we have sensors out there right now logging every single hour, same as the other sensors, but they're not in real time. So you, can't, you can go on my website and you can look up data and you'll see data from two weeks or a month ago, but you won't see today. And if my objective is to help modeling and help understand the system, and for those purposes, I don't need to see what it is right now. Right? We need to see how it's behaved over time as, in relationship to all of these other variables. And so it, they're not real time, but that gives us some real advantages. Right? We can quality control the data before you ever see it. Right? So you can go on to St. John's or Orca, look at the data, and occasionally you'll see some data that just doesn't make any sense. And that's because they're not able to quality control, right? It's coming straight to you. And so you're not seeing if there's a problem in the data until somebody's gone back through and quality controlled it. So, I, so my data, it, we're really happy that we're able to just quality control it before you ever see it. So that's one cool advantage or just difference. Um, and the other thing is by having it not real time, it's a lot less expensive. And the advantage of the lower cost is we have the potential to increase the spatial resolution. Right? And so we can have a lot more of these things in the same area, which allows us to better model uh, how oxygen is behaving in the system. And so if you look at any of these other networks, you have one, maybe two sensors in a basin, which is fantastic. Right? 10 years ago, we had nothing. Um, but what's happening on the left side or the right side of, of these basins, right? The winds, the sediments are very different in different areas. And how can we understand just that picture of hypoxia in the lagoon? And so one of the common assumptions that I see, I talk to just about anybody about the lagoon, they say the lagoon is shallow, it's windy, it's well mixed, right? And so we assume that dissolved oxygen, temperature, salinity are going to be, are going to be well mixed and consistent throughout the water column. And in fact, these are just a couple of sites, but you go out there and you often see lower dissolved oxygen at the bottom, right? And so when we think about placing sensors, right, we can place sensors in the middle of the water column, and that's fantastic if we want to just understand what's happening generally in the lagoon. But if we want to really start to be able to make predictions and start to model what's happening with the nutrients, I think placing sensors towards the bottom is, is going to be really valuable. And so you all remember pretty much this schematic from, from last time I was here talking about what happens to nitrogen and phosphorus when we have oxic sur uh, surface sediments. And so just really quickly to play through that is not how it's supposed to come in. Uh, um, where we have oxic bottom water, right? So if you look on, on the right, you see kind of this dissolved oxygen profile. It's a well-mixed system, right? It didn't matter where we place the sensor. We're able to predict that we're very likely to have an oxic surface sediments. And we're likely to see the nitrogen and phosphorus coming from decaying organic matter being oxidized, either the nitrogen being nitrified and then denitrified, and the phosphorus sticking to the uh, amorphous iron hydro oxyhydroxides that are in the sediments. If we then go to something that is very frequent in the lagoon, right? We see lower dissolved oxygen at the bottom. Now all of a sudden, we get a different picture of what the sediments look like just by placing our sensor in a different location. And so when we look at what happens in these sediments, we don't have that oxic surface layer. And we see nitrogen and phosphorus coming out of those sediments as ammonia, which is one of the species of nitrogen that's readily available to those harmful types of algae and phosphorus that's one of the key factors in controlling algae blooms. And so just selecting placement. And so I just wanted to throw this back up here. This is what you saw in the last presentation, the last time. So I'm hoping you're getting this kind of this, this reference to the importance of phosphorus or oxygen towards controlling phosphorus. But now I'm going to throw on here right next to it the ammonia flux. Right? And so in the last presentation, I showed you kind of that. Ammonia fluxes can be positive or negative. And so this is now looking at that same site. So this is in the northern Banana River over time in sandy sediments. 
when the oxygen is high, right, we see negative fluxes of ammonia, right? The ammonia is actually being pulled from the water into the sediments and it's being oxidized. And so if I were to show you the nitrate fluxes, they would look like the opposite, right? When we have oxygen in the water column or at the sediment water interface, we have nitrate coming out of the sediments. This is the form of nitrogen that's preferred by seagrass leaves, right? It's the kinds of nitrogen that's preferred by a lot of the beneficial species, where when we have these anaerobic events, we shift from a nitrate to an ammonia, right? We're shifting to this, this type of nitrogen that's more favorable to the HAB species, things like Oreobumba leuconensis. In fact, it can't use that nitrate that is coming out of oxidized sandy sediments. And so I, I, I just can't overstate the importance of understanding oxygen in terms of being able to model these fluxes. And so I can highlight, just like I did on the phosphorus one, I can highlight the high fluxes of ammonia. And it's really cool, that last point, right? So it kind of appears that there's a, a decrease in oxygen on kind of at the end of um, April. And you see a negative phosphate flux, but a positive ammonia flux. And this kind of doesn't make sense, but I don't really have time to get into the whole thing, but it just is showing the importance of the timing of when the system went anoxic versus when we actually collected that sample. And so if we had gone back a few days earlier, we would have likely seen a negative ammonia flux right, and, and a positive nitrate flux. And so this is looking at just a short period of time and what we can learn and how these dissolved, bottom water dissolved oxygen data are connected to nutrient cycling. Right? And so start to show you some long-term data. And so this is actually looking at depth, right? So this is looking at, so this is the St. John's River Water Management District sensor that's at O'Galley. And then we have a bottom water DO sensor right below it. And I sh on the screen, the colors are a little bit blended, but the kind of pinkish color is our bottom water sensor. And the blue color is that mid-depth sensor. In the bottom water, and I want to emphasize that these are quality controlled data. These are not fouling issues. So we're not having barnacles or something growing on our sensors making it give us faulty readings. The bottom water is experiencing relatively frequent episodes of hypoxia. They're not necessarily long lasting. But if you now are reflecting back to those fluxes that we showed you for ammonium and phosphorus, you can start to get a picture of what's happening in the lagoon just from looking at that bottom water data. None of that are we capturing in that mid-depth sensor. Right? And so there's so many other cool things that we can do with these bottom water sensors. And so this is looking at bottom type. So one of the questions that I have is, and I'm going to get to that on the, one of these upcoming slides, is what is the extent of hypoxia in the lagoon? Right? How large of an area of the lagoon is hypoxic at any given moment? And so if we have a muck deposit, right, is the sand adjacent to it seeing a signal with respect to oxygen and nutrients from that muck deposit. So is the muck deposit sucking water out of the, the adjacent lagoon? And so we've started to look at that with these sensor networks. I'm hoping to get to support to add to this network and grow and be able to look at how that, that aerial extent of hypoxia expands and contracts. But what you're seeing is overlying muddy deposits, this kind of goes without saying, but those muddy deposits are more often than not completely anaerobic, right? And the water above it is completely anaerobic. And so just really cool to actually have some data to put to that kind of um, assumption that we've made for a long time. And when you look at the, the nutrient fluxes, when you look at those interstitial water profiles that we collect when we measure fluxes in, in mud, uh, these data follow exactly along with what we're seeing. And so I threw this one in here uh, last minute because I knew it was going to go after the talk about the Cocoa Beach uh, dredging project area. So, I really have to thank uh, Wayne and, and Kelsey for supporting my network. They've helped me to get one of these established in the Cocoa Beach area. Um, and so this is looking at dissolved oxygen in, on sandy sediments in the Cocoa Beach area. And you can see that recently, right, when it's been hot, those sandy sediments are experiencing quite a bit of hypoxia, right? The area is sick. And so 
I'm really excited that we have this data. This is one site kind of tucked away. I would I really like to get more out there to be able to monitor a larger area of, of the project. Um, but I absolutely expect that post-construction of, of this restoration project, we'll be able to track the success mm -hmm. just using something like dissolved oxygen. And so I think these are really invaluable in terms of being able to, to show people the accomplishments of these projects, right? And we can tell a lot about what's happening with the nutrients just from looking at these dissolved oxygen data. And so individually, right, when we start to pick these out, we can look at individually, we can gain some really cool information from these different sites. But collectively, right, by building a large network, collectively, we're starting to have some really good information that can contribute to models, right? You've probably talked to modelers, and uh, they're desperate for good information to put into models. How can we model nutrient loading in the lagoon if we don't know what's happening at that sediment water interface? How can we model phosphorus fluxes right, if we don't know what's happening um, to oxygen at the bottom? And so I think we've opened the door to um, some really cool information. And so, so my question, I've been asking this for years, and I'm finally getting enough data to, to push to have enough data to uh, be able to answer it. But this is a picture of the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, right? This is kind of a seasonal event, and they have the luxury of being able to go out and measure it uh, carefully over long periods of time. But this is exactly what I'm imagining being able to do in the lagoon. And so, in my opinion, right, one of the most important questions towards understanding the lagoon, plus selecting restoration sites and also quantifying and improving outcomes of restoration, is being able to, to know what is that aerial extent of hypoxia in the lagoon. And so I mentioned models already, but those nutrient load models and HAB models, right? If we can better model, is the nitrogen going to be ammonia? Is it going to be a nitrate, right? If we can model that, I don't know how we're modeling this stuff without it, right? We're using the available data and the models work, but if you talk to the modelers, they still do have many challenges. And I think this would be a huge step toward, towards improving those models. Um, and so going from models, right, benthic organisms have limited tolerance towards hypoxia. And so we are seeing limited success of some restoration projects because we're using very limited data to, to kind of pick these sites. And so, so dissolved oxygen is one of the key factors in, in determining these habitat, habitat suitability indices, right? And so, um, so thinking about things like oyster restoration. And then seagrasses, right? Seagrasses don't necessarily need tons of oxygen, but if we know that there's areas that do experience hypoxia, there are also areas likely experiencing hydrogen sulfide, right? And hydrogen sulfide is toxic to seagrasses. And so oxygen sensors are hypothetically value, like this network is really valuable towards all kinds of, pick your favorite restoration project, there's an application of this data. And so oyster restoration, just kind of reflecting on, because I've worked with it, had some really good collaboration from the zoo, so I wanted to talk briefly about oyster restoration. So presently, oyster restoration is very, relatively successful near historic oyster reefs, right? So, so we're picking historic oyster reefs, re, uh, rebuilding them, and we're having pretty good success. Um, and oxygen, again, oxygen is, is essential towards that success. And one of the reasons that I believe we're having good success is the habitat suitability in an area that had an oyster reef is probably pretty good. Um, and so currently, if we look at the amount of oyster reef that's out there now, and so this data this is from personal communication with Tyler Provence at the zoo. So uh, he says there's two miles of oyster reef in the lagoon right now. And the Save Our Lagoon plan has a goal of 20 miles of oyster reef, right? And so we need new locations. We need no, new locations that are going to be successful. And so we think this dissolved oxygen network can be an invaluable tool in making that happen. And so we've actually been working with the zoo. I've had a lot of support from the zoo. Um, they've actually helped, they've actually bought some sensors to contribute data to this network uh, because they see it's so important. Um, and so, in the discussions with them, they're telling me that the presently they're selecting sites with relatively limited data, right? They're looking at kind of monthly surveys and what the auction is in bottom water for a sawn cast that's taken during the day, right? And so not saying that that's wrong, just saying that's the data that's available. And so, and so again, our network can track DO at these sites before uh, site selection. and. Like I said, we've been working with the zoo, and I'm really excited that they believe in us enough to, that they've bought sensors to, to locate at some of their sites, um, and they're 
contributing data to this, and then we're going to use FIT to kind of assemble the collective data sets and hopefully produce some really cool products. Um, and so, referencing back to the dredging, capping, and restoration, we can see measurable decreases in hypoxia and nutrient fluxes in these areas. And so this is kind of a picture of that Cocoa Beach rest restoration area. I'm showing you hydrogen sulfide concentrations, a contour of it, uh, just to show you that there are variations across the area. And so as Jim said, there are areas that are worse and areas that are better. And so we might want to focus efforts on some of those worst areas, right? If we had to select doing a really good job in one spot, making it really successful, and then maybe not touching an area that's, that's bad but not really bad, that may be an approach. Um, and so tracking the success, again, just showing the dissolved oxygen data um, in, again, sandy sediments in this region, I think we have some really good ways to track the success of these projects. Um, and so I have up here just some numbers. Sandy sediments, 100 milligrams per meter squared per hour is the sediment oxygen. And that's the amount of oxygen being consumed by the bacteria decomposing organic matter in those sediments. And it's at least three times higher in muddy sediments. And so when we do a capping or dredging project, we absolutely expect to see a decrease in what we're calling that sediment oxygen demand. And, and associated nitrogen and phosphorus fluxes. And so we're able to track that pretty well using something like DO sensors. And so, so it, we're really excited that we have this data. Um, and so understanding the natural system and to promote successful restoration, so this kind of goes without saying, but just to retouch, right? It's my opinion that the aerial extent of, hy extent of hypoxia in the lagoon has expanded over the years, right? And so when we think about dredging, and these low energy environments, as they're filling up, right? if we let them fill up, these fine grained organic rich materials have to go somewhere. They're going to start spreading into the sand. And once it spreads into the sand, it's much more difficult to deal with. The organic matter content of lagoon sand is very high compared to the organic matter of other coastal areas. right? And so um, as we increase organic matter, we're going to increase the aerial extent of hypoxia. Um, and Expanding that aerial extent of hypoxia inhibits nitrification, right? Which is an essential step in that coupled nitrification, denitrification. And then also expanding aerial hypoxia decreases the sorption capacity of, of sediments for phosphorus, right? And so we're having less area of the lagoon sorb phosphorus. And it's my belief, and one kind of a hypothesis that I have, that the expanding hy and hypoxia in the lagoon has led to lower uptake of phosphorus by sediments, and in fact, we're seeing a disproportionate increase in the phosphorus concentrations in the lagoon over time. And this is one possible explanation that I think we could really get at uh, by, by looking at these DO data. Um, and so I just wanted to end this with, we've really had fun doing this. I've been excited to be able to build this network of sensors. And through various projects, we've had really cool public support for, for what we're doing. And it's opened the door for a lot of outreach. So I'm going to have Abby come up to just close this talk out um, and mention some of the outreach we've done. Hi. Um, so I'll just start by saying, wow. Um, I am absolutely blown away by public support that we've gotten through research in the lab. It gets easy to kind of feel like people don't really care about the environment, but if you take a look at this map, these are some of the schools that I've been able to be in contact with and engage with and talk with the teachers, and I think that alone shows you that people care. Um, and so we know how important education is. According to the Sorrel, this is one of the most cost-effective ways to actually prevent inputs of nitrogen and phosphorus. And so absolutely I agree with the statement, especially after being able to engage um, with a lot of these students and teachers. And so. One thing that I've noticed through these engagements is that these teachers are approaching me. They're asking me, do you have supplemental material for us? Are there other things that I can bring into the classroom to get these students involved? Um, and I think that's really encouraging. And obviously, we aren't complete experts K through 12. There's only so many things you can be um, perfect at. And so through this, we're seeing that Generally, schools, they know about eutrophication in simplistic ways, so there's a lot of nitrogen, there's a lot of phosphorus, but a lot of the time the conversation is, how does this impact our non, or how does this impact our charismatic megafauna and macroflora, like our seagrasses and our manatees, and that's kind of where the conversation ends, and so something like denitrification, um, really important ecosystem service, this isn't really prevalent in the classroom, and we'd like to kind of change this and bring it more into the classroom, and so 
when's the last time you've had a child come up to you excitingly and say, save our sand? <laughs> You probably haven't. Uh, that doesn't surprise me, and we'd really like to change this. And so we are collaborating and working with a team to develop interactive um, educational modules. And so this little animated character at the bottom, this is one of the teams that we're working with that specialize with media and marketing. And this is a little interactive character, um, Ingot, that they've created in old um, modules for educational purposes and they use this to get the children involved, adults engaged in working with the material and I think this would be an excellent way to get students more excited and encouraged in the classrooms. Our team's main goal is to actually, you know, with the growing support of this ne network would be to have these K through 12 classes adopt a sensor. Um, this this will give the students a feeling of ownership over the data. This gets them engaged. This gets them working early on with the real world data that can be applied to so many different restoration efforts happening. And I think that having them really excited and making them feel like this is something that they can do in the future, they can pursue STEM careers and be successful in it. Um, I think we could see the benefits in that immediately. And of course, Florida Tech, you know, we're hoping if this network is supported, we can continue maintaining the network, do the QA, QC quality control. But overall, these students would be able to go home at the end of the day, go to their family and say, look at our school's data. Look what we're doing. Look what we're contributing to, talking with their friends. And then just that alone, you're expanding the conversation even more. And so now you have all of these students really excited, really engaged, and um, I think this would be a fantastic opportunity um, to also just raise awareness in the lagoon. And so not only do our DO sensors, they help track changes of dissolved oxygen, we can help monitor the success of restoration projects, help improve models, but it can also be a really valuable educational tool to bring into these classrooms. So, thank you very much. And so Abby's been a, a fantastic student, and she's, she's really helping to drive this forward and really helped in kind of the educational aspect. Um, so again, special thanks to a lot of people. Brevard Zoo, we've had to help with. Um, I, I didn't put the logo on here, but the city of Cocoa Beach, so Kelsey and, and Wayne have been, have been really helpful in getting this system up and going. Um, and so we've had support from all kinds of people. Um, so we, we really appreciate you listening to us, and we're just hoping that people start to use our, use our data and think it's something they can contribute to the lagoon. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure there may be some questions, but before we do that, uh, let's see if we can get a motion to extend the meeting. Just 15 minutes. Is there, is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Okay, any discussion? All right, all those in favor of 15-minute extension, say aye. Aye. Okay, we got 15 minutes. All right, so well, actually 20, 19 minutes. So <laughs> anybody, anybody have any questions for Dr. Fox or Abby? Oh, Dr. Windsor, you I do. I, I was trying to find my hand to reach up and ask the question. Uh, is your data set available online now so that people in the public who are watching this today could go out and look at it? It is. Uh, I had a website that it was on. I'm it, currently in the process of uh, merging it onto an FIT website. Uh, so I will have to relook up the temporary URL that it's been moved to, but I, I can make that available. Uh, the goal, from day one, the data was publicly available. Um, so you can go on our website. Again, I said my URL. It's been taken down in the last like week um, as I'm trying to merge it onto an FIT web page. All right, David? So I, one was a question for clarification. What do you mean by continuous but not real time. Does that just mean you can't transmit your data back because you don't have a transmitter, or what? what's so going on with that? So yeah. discrete would be, so when we go out and do the nutrient fluxes, we go out, we install some equipment and monitor fluxes for a day, mm -hmm. and then we take it back to the lab. So the continuous is it's measuring every single hour. So it's, right, it's out there right now collecting data. Our sensor's out there right now collecting data. So that's the continuous. The non-real time simply means you can't go on right now and see the data. So we are not transmitting it. We actually go out when we do the sensor maintenance. Um, I mean, there's some really good things about that. We have to go do maintenance anyways. If you're not maintaining it, then your data is not going to be good anyways. So you have to go to them. Um, and we really like the fact that we're giving quality controlled data. Um, so that's one, just one of the issues I've run into. So it's continuous. The non-real time just means you're not transmitting the data back where you can see it online, and you have to enter that data or upload it, but you're logging it, yes. just not uploading it. So you have to go out. So if you had a data transmitter, you could 
make those same sensors real time? You can make sensor real time. Uh, Again, some of the issues is that gets a lot more expensive, and so that decreases the ability to have high spatial resolution uh, if you're working with the same amount of funding. Um, and so we really like the way we're doing it. And then again, I also really like the ability to quality control the data, because if I give the data to a modeler, right, they don't go through and say, oh, this recent data is bad. They just plug it into the model. And so if, if I'm 100% sure that what they're getting has been quality controlled, it's going to provide the most robust models that we can that we can build. I'd love to know how you're managing sensor fouling and recalibrations, but we'll take that offline. Um, the, uh, I guess another thought I had from your pre presentation, what you have right now, um, is that if you combine your sensor data for measuring dissolved oxygen, both at surface and lower level, uh, with some real-time weather forecasting, measuring your UV and solar irradiation, and a coming forecast, you should be able to make a predictive model of when your fish kill is going to happen in that region, correct? I mean, you should be able to see, guess what, tomorrow it's going to be super cloudy and we're already seeing dissolved oxygen dropping down to like 20, 30 percent. This place is going to go completely anoxic all the way up to the surface levels. Because when I measure dissolved oxygen during low wind events, which is part of the problem, there's a lot of when you get low wind and low light, uh, even six inches down, I'm seeing no dissolved oxygen that's with sustainable and it's sustainable for life. So I don't how benthic organisms are, you know, not being completely wiped out and how they repopulate to keep this lagoon alive. I, I don't is a mystery to me. Um, but uh, I mean, have you thought about making predictive combining the weather and some stations maybe to do a predictive like fish kill predictor? So. Absolutely, that's one of the goals. Again, that's a little bit outside of my expertise because there are people making these models right now. Uh, and so the National Estuary Program is working with folks to build exactly that models that incorporate this, these weather predictions with the available data. But, but one of the biggest challenges they have is data availability. There's no data for dissolved oxygen at the bottom other than our network. And so we're, we're again, our data is available, but it's still relatively limited. and. We're supporting it the best we can, but it was part of, we built it initially as part of that flushing project that's, that's no, not funded currently. And so we've kept our sensors going with students and myself working nights and weekends and that kind of stuff. But, uh, but we're, so we're going to keep it going as best we can. We're hoping to add to it because we really do believe that um, you can see how important oxygen is towards understanding the nitrogen phosphorus fluxes. And yes, understanding how it's going to kill these organisms. And where I'm headed is, Yes, if we had live real-time data, I could go on, click on it, I could say, okay, this, it's been fluctuating today, we're likely to have a fish kill if it gets cloudy. We don't necessarily need to have the data from today. We can just say this region has really dynamic oxygen, right? And so this is a region that when it gets cloudy, we should start to worry about. And so, so there are ways to use the non-real-time. It would be wonderful if it could all be real-time, but just... Again, I think the increased spatial resolution is far more important than having real time, at least at this moment, because we don't have many responses. I was thinking about the ability to provide intervention in a region. Uh, I mean, one question, final point, I guess I'd say is, with what you're studying, seeing these low dissolved oxygen levels go to freaking insupportable completely for anything to live at the benthic level, uh, I'd love to know what, if you combine yourself with maybe a biologist to see what species are being completely wiped out that can't repopulate fast enough and how that could possibly changing the environment if we were able to prevent you know these zero oxygen levels from happening all the time would the sediment layers would the benthic creatures that would live there make an impact on you know the environment's sustainability and, and recovery and, and the answer is yes i've worked with some biologists and Absolutely, right? The areas that go hypoxic, and so we look at the infauna living in these muck deposits that are basically perpetually hypoxic, and then the sand, and you see this, this transition, both lower, uh, lower diversity in the muck, and then we have a lot of sp um, nutrient tolerant species, and so we have some like two or three types of clams, and, and sometimes um, snails or whelk that, that can survive in those really hypoxic regions. They don't survive very well, but they're able to come back in quickly after, after the disturbance. And so 
yes, we could do a lot more in that area, but there's a lot of data to show that the places that are oxic a lot have a lot higher diversity and are more resilient to, to other stressors. Thanks. Great All presentation. Right. Thank you. Uh, Laura Lee had her hand raised. Sorry, Laura Lee. Um, that was a great presentation. Um, my, my, you know, my interest is in the Northern Lagoon, Southern Mosquito Lagoon, the Northern Banana River Lagoon, and um, I see that all of your um, monitoring, air, you know, stations are in the central, central part of the lagoon. What would it take to get you guys to start looking at? I mean, maybe NASA won't let you into the Northern Banana River, but I think that's a critical area that needs to be studied. But what would it take to get you into the Northern Indian River Lagoon and Southern Mosquito Lagoon? How much money? <laughs> um, I guess it depends on exactly the number of sensors and how... Um, how robust we want the data to be, right? Yeah. We can get a few sensors up there relatively inexpensively. I guess my goal is, I mean, for the same cost of one of these existing kinds of sensors, we can have a large number of, of the sensors we're using. Um, and so just, the, again, that increased spatial resolution. So I'd love to be working up there, just something, the projects that we've worked on that have supported this so far have not been in those regions. Uh, and then you mentioned NASA. So NASA just re released a report indicating that they're looking to collaborate with folks to, to monitor things like nutrients. And so I think they would absolutely be on board to at least letting us get up there if we could find support for that, that monitoring. Good. Maybe, they could, you know, maybe they could help you get some monitors into the northern Banana River and at the mouth of the Banana Creek east of Titusville. But you know, the reason I'm asking is because we need data that supports the removal of the causeways. And, and, you know, we're looking at the NASA bridge. It is the immediate thing. And we don't have enough data that supports the, the removal of the causeways. And so if, you're, if you could show that the dissolved oxygen near the bottom is critically low in these three areas where your water move, you know, and the water sits there for a year. I mean, you do have data, Gary Zarillo has, has data that shows the water circulation. It takes a year for the water to move. So if you could maybe couple that with the fact that the, the dissolved oxygen near the bottom is critically low in those areas, it might help get us some more data to support the removal of the causeways in, in the northern Indian River, northern Banana River. And so, absolutely. I mean, I, I, that's one of the goals with this is to get sensors in, in those kind of tucked away corners. And so the muck deposits that we've talked about, some of these large fluxing deposits, are, are tucked back in those low energy environments behind the causeways. Um, and so that muck versus sand, right? That muck deposits actually, that I showed in this presentation, is, is one of the ones behind Pineda Causeway. Um, and so there are lots of applications of this data. Just if we can get support and people saying these are the types of questions we want to ask, because my overarching question is just what is the aerial extent of hypoxia? But it's so easy to incorporate those other R causeways. That's part of that question, right? R causeways are a contributor to the hypoxic zones. And I think that's absolutely part of it. But if, again, it depends on the support. Is the support want to look at specifically causeways or the bigger lagoon or, or restoration or, or everything? Thank you. All right, any further questions for Dr. Fox? Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think if you do the sponsor a sensor, you know, like you have like a sponsor section of a highway, people will put sensors out there, and I think you should call them do sensors, because they do stuff. Do stuff, I like it, but, and, all right. And so, so we're really excited, and so on, on that comment, um, like I said, working with the zoo, one of the cool things that we're hoping to do is be able to get other groups that have good quality mm -hmm. control to be able to contribute to this. And then we're going to syn synthesize the data so we can get not just us, but if other people are interested and have, have the ability to contribute, we, we want to get a growing network that can have support from other places. And the sponsors, it's really important to have that quality control. So as I think Abby said, we'd, we'd like to have, at least initially, FIT do the maintenance and quality control, but we'd have different groups, absolutely. To this point, yeah. Sponsor them and, and take ownership of that data. 
You could put your name in the Indian River Lagoon on a map if you sponsored sensors that spelled your name out. And then yeah. you have some really good spatial resolution. All right. Thank you thank very you. much, thank Dr. Fox. Thank you, Abby. Okay. Um, so we will go now to uh, public. Laura Lee, did you have another question? Yeah, I did. I You didn't answer how much it costs per sensor. I mean, if, if we're going to try to go out and find sponsors for the sensors, we need to know what our target is. Yeah. Do you even have an estimate of what it would cost to get these sensors up in into other areas? So, I do. Um, I guess one of the challenges is is it's a function of scale because we have to have. So when I go and start to move into the northern lagoon, it would be really nice to be able to do. We do a loop where we can service many sensors, and so if I put a single sensor out, it's going to be a lot more expensive per sensor than if we do a, a large cluster. And so if we think about support on the order of a few, a couple of the existing types of sensors, we could have really good spatial coverage. Um, and so I know that's not an exact answer, but I think it gives you some idea of where we're headed. Do you have a cost uh, to what you have out deployed now? Like for the program so far as it exists, do you have a cost that you've incurred? Um, not for all of the monitoring, but for the actual sensors and to initiate the locations. So to initiate a new location, there's the initial cost and then there's, again, that maintenance cost. But the initial cost is a few thousand dollars. A few thousand dollars to get a new location online. That's the nothing. I'm sorry? I said that's nothing. Well, that, yeah, that's yeah. just yeah. for the sensors. And that's but, what I'm but, saying. But, yeah. the, the maintenance, and so there's consumables that go into the sensors and then servicing the sensors. And so I don't want to give people the idea that this is, like, super inexpensive. But, again, that's why adding, once we have the network established, once we have the, the maintenance of the sensors in place, then adding additional sites can be really inexpensive. It sounds to me like maybe a junior achievement combo where they got students working on a business plan to figure out how much it would cost to bring that in might might work. And, and so, so my estimate again is just the cost of a few of so two or three of the existing sensors that are, that are out there could support a large network of of these sensors. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Fox. Thank you. Okay, so right now we'll take uh, open public comment. I don't have any. Oh, okay, we have some people. Oh, will you come down to the mic, please, so that people at home can hear you? Sure. Oh. Can you text them? And please state your, your name, uh, and then you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Steve Hancock. Um, I'm uh, representing Sunnyland Beach, which is a neighborhood uh, actually in the southern part of Brevard County. Um, I, and I've got a little backgrounder here on the neighborhood and some of the things that are going on there. I wanted to start by thanking uh, the, the, uh, commi the, the committee, rather, and the, um, and the presenters, Dr. Fox and, and others, for the um, insightful presentations. Um, I wanted to talk just a little bit about our neighborhood and what's kind of going on down there. Uh, Sunnyland Beach is a, um, it's a canal community. Uh, it's about six miles north of the Sebastian Inlet. It's actually quite a special area. It's immediately to the east of what some people call the Mullet Creek Islands. Um, it's a very natural area. I mean, we've got, there was one time we counted 78 manatees in, our, um, in, our, in the canal behind our house. Uh, dolphin routinely in the area. Um, Fit, obviously, you know, you know, plenty of fish, snook, so forth. Um, there was bald eagles. <laughs> um, we have osprey uh, because of these natural islands. Uh, it's really a special area in the estuary from a um, you know from a natural standpoint. And a lot of the neighbors, a lot of the neighborhood residents, uh, the community recognizes that. Um, We've observed here in the last couple of years a marked decline in the, uh, in the particularly in the water quality. Um, to that end, uh, we've formed a uh, an environmental advocacy group in the neighborhood, um, and actually the, the the response has been remarkable. We've had um, actually probably about 25 people show up now just you know on a volunteer basis we've actually divided up into working groups to address um, a number of items um, 
everything ranging from uh, in, increasing bat nesting, um, uh, natural plantings and uh, water filtration buffers, um, things to help deal with the stormwater situation, which uh, because the neighborhood was built so long ago, our stormwater management is very poor and, and um, basically just drains into the lagoon. Um, uh, looking into the, um, the vendors that are doing like lawn spraying in the area, finding out what kind of things they're putting uh, uh, onto the, uh, you know, introducing into the environment. Um, increasing participation in uh, oyster gardening, just a number of different initiatives. But we're just a neighborhood. Uh, and actually, it's a voluntary POA. We can't like assess people or even find, you know, we can't control anybody in the neighborhood. Um, but like I said, the, the, the response has been overwhelming, so the community interest is there. And what we're looking to do now is, uh, through this volunteer organization, partner with government and um, uh, educational and uh, academic uh, initiatives to, um, to amplify those efforts. Because you know we can't do it on our own. I think you guys can do more uh, with, uh, you know, with community involvement. Um, I mean, just, just in the presentation we heard today, obviously one of the real problems we've got is the muck in the canals. Um, I believe it's Mr. Dawson. Um, one of our residents uh, has already been in touch with Mr. Dawson. We were on the list, I guess, for muck dredging, um, but because of funding priorities and so forth, we got bumped off. Sorry, I guess I used up my three minutes. Can I have just a couple more minutes? Let's, let's, let's do this. Can we get a motion to extend the meeting for five minutes? Second. Okay. okay. All those I'll, in favor? I'll, I'll wrap it up. Aye. But, um, Aye. Hold on one second. Let's take this vote just so we can continue the meeting. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll wrap it up. But, um, you know, the muck dredging, um, obviously any kind of improvements to the stormwater uh, situation, um, you know, unless this just involves a few plants and volunteer efforts, um, you know, we really need to obviously be engaged with the county government and so forth to, to really to really make things happen. So anyway, that's that's. Uh, I look forward to speaking with some folks after the meeting if they have time. I know, like for example, the the um, uh, the idea of pumping water, seawater in, or whatever. I actually think our area could be uh, an ideal place as a test for actually a micro version of that to, to improve circulation through the canals, uh, introduce new you know exchange water. Um, anyway, to just to summarize, we are engaged. Um, we look forward to working with um, the community. And we've got a couple of other residents here. And uh, again, one thing, I'm, I'm Debbie, his wife. Um, one of the things we realize you is the mic, Debbie, just yeah, so people online can hear you. there is an active group of people that are very engaged in this, but it's a 265 home mm -hmm. community. And so I'm going to work real hard to try to get more involvement and awareness. A lot of people don't know that when their lawn service blows mm -hmm. it in the canal, that's what's, you know, so we're going to have a, a fair in January where we're going to try to have all materials and educate people and, and hopefully get more of the community to understand that they're part of this. So, that's fantastic. So. There is no such thing as just a neighborhood. So thank you all for coming on doing your part. And please reach out to Virginia so she can get some speakers to come to your fair. Um, I'll come dance if it'll bring more people, <laughs> whatever. But, but seriously, this, this, is what, this is what our county needs. This is what we are. So thank you for your time for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any other uh, public comment? All right. Any any comment from anybody on the board or uh, yes, Dr. Quick Winter, please. Question for Virginia for November's meeting. We have the quarterly progress reports, review the project plans, and we're meeting in this room, or don't you know yet? Um, probably, but no, I don't know yet. If the, if the committee's okay with that, then we'll plan to meet in this room. I'm I'm looking at Carol to make sure we have this room reserved. Yes, okay. Good question, Dr. Winter. Thank you. Yeah, so next month is going to be busy. We've got the projects to look at and our quarterlies, so um, it should be exciting. Okay, anyone else have anything they'd like to say? 
I just wanted to comment that it's excellent to see so many uh, educational endeavors represented today and just across the board. I really think that's key and junior achievement, FIT, the zoo, Cocoa Beach. Thank you all um, for your personal engagement in choosing to do this. Um, it's not represented nearly enough at uh, question time, really what the work is accomplishing in the community. So thank you. All right. And with that, we'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much, everybody. The opinions expressed by any member of the public during any period of public comment do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, or the program sponsor and are solely those of the presenter. The Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, and the program sponsor hereby expressly disclaim any and all responsibility or liability for any defamatory or slanderous statements expressed by any member of the public during any such period. spoke a little bit about food and housing insecurity. During the pandemic, we did a survey through the Hope Center at Miami-Dade College. 77% of our students said they were food insecure and they were housing insecure, didn't know where they would get their next meal. Those are the things that when students stop out of college are the barriers. It's not because they're not in pursuit of the American dream. It's not because they want to finish, but real life uh, things get in the way. And so at Miami-Dade College, like at Valencia and Hillsboro, we put together emergency grant programs to be able to get emergency grants to students. We have food pantries on our campuses so they can come in, no questions asked, have that bag of groceries uh, to take home, and then connecting them through single stop to other support services. That's wonderful. It really does take a village, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, Senator and, Torres, would you like to add to this, please? I, I just want to uh, include Father Ro Rodriguez here because Father Rodriguez was instrumental in Central Florida for vaccination centers and how he helped Hispanics with the COVID-19 and and to overcome or the vaccine hesitancy. So, Father Rodriguez, would you please uh, what you do? Yeah. I'm, I'm unable. Uh, actually, I was uh, messaging um, the senator um, privately. We'll be making a, lar um, a fairly large announcement um, next week. Um, but I can say is that we've been very active in getting our neighbors vaccinated, but not just getting the neighbors vaccinated, um, really hitting on misinformation head on, especially misinformation and bad information and dangerous information that's coming from faith groups. Um, we've been working with social media experts, pushing videos, um, um, promoting the vaccine. Um, we are promoting two vaccine events this weekend. Our last vaccine event um, two weeks ago brought in 216 walk-ins to get vaccinated within um, four hours when most vaccine events are lucky to bring in 20. Um, wow. Part of this has been a very, very aggressive faith-based um, attack against those who are harming our community with bad and dangerous information. And we really welcome these opportunities to partner, um, but you know, it's a, it's a huge disparity um, I am personally concerned about the long haul effects of COVID infection. Um, a, a lot of my parishioners who are recovering from COVID are in a really bad place um, with their health. They were in a bad place to begin with, with diabetes and other disparities. And many of them are manifesting these long haul issues that may lead for some of them to go to disability. Um, this is really a danger to our community. It's not just getting sick and potentially dying. Um, there's gonna be some long-term effects 
effects into our community um, when we get out of this pandemic. Um, and we need to find ways of working together to mitigate them. And we need to find ways of addressing them now um, so we can help build up families before um, these issues um, harm them. And thank you, Senator Torres, for um, letting us speak to this. Thank you. Thank you. And I don't thank know, you Paul, very much. Paul, hey, uh, if you want to interject anything that the, the chamber is doing in, in, you know, for vaccinations or mask wearing, or what's the, what is, what is your feel on this? Yeah, most definitely, you know, we, we, uh, we propagate all that information that, that is provided to us from from our counties and, and cities and the CDC and make sure that in, in all our all of our programmings and activities and events, uh, we promote uh, the, the use of a face mask. You know, we cannot um, uh, uh, force anyone to, uh, to to go against their will to get vaccinated, but at least in, in, in our events and, and when we are um, uh, out in the community, you know, we, we want to keep all the safety measures, uh, wearing face mask, uh, using sanitizer, and, and keeping the, the social distancing. Uh, but, you know, one thing that, that we've been involved is with, with several um, uh, food pantries, drive through food pantries, also because the need is real. And, uh, you know, a personal experience uh, during the pandemic last year, uh, the first um, food drive that we um, put together at one of the churches, uh, we are now, and it was announced in, in, in television and, uh, you know, my, my phone started blowing up and I didn't even know that uh, they were going to put my number <laughs> on, 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 at the, in the news. And I received um, calls from people even in Tampa uh, who were looking for, uh, for, for food or for places to get groceries. Uh, I personally drove uh, two or three times to Melbourne uh, to take um, groceries to different families that uh, that were that, that had their own illnesses. You know, the, a lady who who was uh, who is disabled, she couldn't uh, get out and to any of these food drives, or she didn't have any transportation. So you know, we, we went all the way to Melbourne to take uh, groceries and and try to put her in contact with some of the uh, local authorities or local places where uh, they can uh, the, the, her needs will be met. Uh, more easily um, and faster than me coming all the way from uh, the Orlando area uh, to Melbourne. But uh, the need is real, um, not only for our, our communities, you know, the, the businesses have been dealing um, with a lot of uh, shortage of staff. Um, you know, during this pandemic, it's, it's tough when people are afraid to go out and, and to go back to a, a, the normalcy that that you expect and uh, businesses are, are suffering be because of that you know the pandemic hasn't um it hasn't gone away uh, and the needs of our communities and our businesses is still there uh, you know but uh, we're very grateful that you know uh, entities like the sba uh, and the local governments have provided uh, programs that have alleviated some of these um uh, some of these issues, but we're still uh, we're still far away from uh, from going back to normal. Thank, Thank you, you very Jorge. much, Jorge. And um, you know, I, I don't want to end this this wonderful meeting um, speaking mostly about what we're worried about and and bad outcomes. I'd like to honor, recognize, and celebrate our Hispanic heritage. So I, I want to go back to Ms. Hevia and ask her to tell everyone about the, the the baseball museum in Ybor City and how that came to be. Well, thank you so much. Um, a few years ago, the Department of Transportation had to move a house to make way for the interstate. And it just so happened that Al Lopez's house had to be moved. Now, Al Lopez was Tampa's first major league player manager and Hall of Fame inductee. He was also the second Hispanic, are you ready for this, to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Roberto Clemente was numero uno, and numero dos four years later was Al Lopez. So the Ebor Society Museum Society said, how can we not create this museum? And uh, so the house was moved, we rehabilitated it, um, and uh, we created exhibits that celebrate all the baseball that started here in Ybor City. It, 
the inspiration comes first from the Cubans who came here and formed their first uh, team in 1887. They taught others and so they engaged the community. It was recreation. It was so much part of that culture. They loved baseball. What, what it ended up being was a way for people to get out of the, um, the neighborhoods, you know, uh, parents, grandparents, uh, grandparents like my own, you know, that came from, from other countries had children who could now do something unique and different and very, very successful. So people, um, you know, transcended their own backgrounds to become either people that just love to coach and play and people that are greats like Al Lopez, Tina Martinez, Lou Pinella, uh, uh, Luis Gonzalez. And they all have had such a message for our community because it started with Al. No, 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 we have, by the way, 89 major league players from Tampa. So, wow. so um, the first happened. one said, well, if Al can do it, you know, he's, he's the son of a cigar workers. If he can do it, I can do it. And it went on and on and on and on and on. And, um, you know, the Smithsonian has done a, um, an exhibit that we're going to bring to Tampa in 2025 called baseball, uh, in the barrios and the big leagues. And it talks about stickball, where it all started. Uh, oh, yeah. I love that. <laughs> I love that. That's terrific. <laughs> I guess terrific. what I what I want to say is that we have a celebration every day of the Hispanic community, and we have a microcosm of how it began in that first league, amateurs to minor leagues to major leagues. We've had five managers from Tampa, five, two of them managed for the Rays. One is still the manager of the Rays. The other one is manager of the White Sox, which is mm -hmm. uh, 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 Tony La Russa. So we've had so many Hispanics go out into the world and make a name for themselves and serve as um, inspiration, as, as mentors uh, to others. And, you know, I see them doing great work in the community too. That's what I really love about the baseball community. Yes, they're out there also helping to feed people, helping to educate people. And uh, so we're very excited to share this and celebrate it every day and to make sure that children in particular come into the museum, both of them really, and see, well, people who had very tough times and, and tough beginnings, look what they were able to do because they work so hard. I also am a uh, first to go to college in my family and, you know, that, all my uh, contemporaries, it was such a big thing to be able to go to get a full education, not only in high school, but then to go to college. You know, some of us have gotten master's degrees, some have gotten PhDs, but there's so much that this community was able to start to expand the Hispanic heritage. Thank you so much. And um, Senator Torres, I think we'll end by, I wanna ask you a question and, and um, I want you to highlight the ways that you celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month and uh, and perhaps every month beyond. So give me some recommendations. Bueno, siempre es un orgullo hablar español y, y comuni comunizarte con la comunidad, hablar con todo el mundo. Este, yo, I believe that we have to, uh, we uh, in our capacities, we need to communicate with the public all the time. Uh, and let them know who we are and what we do and what we bring to the table. I think one of the, the issues that I see uh, many of the folks in our culture don't even know who we are or don't even know that we exist and don't even you know realize that how important it is for them to um, have a voice you know in, in, in what we do and how we uh, affect their lives and their children's lives. Uh, this has always been for me um, the biggest uh, thing is always uh, a people person to talk to people to express who we are and I carry my my cards on me all the time because I feel I represent you you know I'm here for you and the best way of knowing that is by letting them know uh, what you're gonna you know what you want to do for them and and reach out to them because in time of crisis uh, like Father Rodriguez says, and like Jorge says, and like everybody's saying here, 
Um, people need to know where the resources are for them when they, in times of need, because many of them don't understand uh, the process. I, I just feel that my pride is, and you see me on the Senate floor, I'll express myself in Spanish, I'll say something in Spanish, just to make people aware that we are here, our presence is here. You know, don't don't put us in a back burner because no, we have so shown from history, like Chantal's just said, how we have been integrated into the process here with the with the American culture and how we have progressed and how we bring billions of dollars into the economy and why we are needed here and why our community should be respected and why those undocumented people here come just like they came from boatloads from Europe, right? When they came from Europe and both Irish and Italian and all them, they came here. Nobody, you know, oh, where do you live? Over here in Little Italy, where do you live in Irish? They were accommodated. We ought to have the same aspect to our community, to un undocumented who come here because they want a better life and for their children and for their families. So we need to keep on uh, having that fight. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. You're terrific. And you know, I will mention that I'm not sure, as appreciative as my children are, I'm not sure they understand fully the struggles of um, of their great great grandparents and all, all the way down. And um, I find it very important to um, highlight in my household and my family the Hispanic artists, um, uh, the Hispanic poets. Read his read the Spanish poetry and. You know, let's um, let's raise up and celebrate Lin Manuel Miranda, who created uh, one of the most magnificent pieces of work on Hamilton with Hamilton on Broadway, and have second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth graders, um, you know, re reciting history through a, a new avenue of uh, of um, intelligence and explanation. And I I I, uh, I applaud those kind of efforts. We support and we should be supporting small businesses. Identify those Latino businesses. It's not just the restaurants and the wonderful food that we cook. There are jewelry stores, there are mortgage companies, there are title companies, there are tech companies. You know, seek them out and let's help them. And we as public figures should be highlighting them and speaking with them and putting them on our Facebook and um, helping them. There's also our small business associations that that help um, anyone really who wants to um, to start a business of their own. There's so much help there and a lot of people have no idea what's available and the education grants that are available. So I think the onus is on us to help our Hispanic Latino community and raise everyone up. Um, so I want to thank Chantel and Senator Torres and Father Rodriguez and Jorge and Madeline very, very much for joining us. It's been a pleasure to have a conversation and speak among all of you about how important our Hispanic heritage is. Uh, Senator George, you wanna close it up? I just feel that you've, you've, said, you've said everything that should be, has been, been said. Uh, I wish that everyone um, uh, looks at the, this coming year with a positive attitude as to uh, making our community uh, more viable uh, and understanding our culture much better. Um, we celebrate our culture every day, not just from one for one month. So don't get me don't don't get me started because I'll tell you, yo siempre soy boricua para que tú lo sepa every day of the day of the week, and I live for it. And I'm proud of it. I'm proud of who I am. And I tell every Hispanic, whatever culture you're from, respect it and, and live it because you have this life and let no one take away from you that you have the opportunity of speaking two languages because es lo más importante que tú puedes hablar dos idiomas que nadie puede hacerlo. This is what we have and this is what we bring to the table and this is our, our chance and opportunity. So thank you, Janet Cruz, for everything you do and, and, and Annette Tadeo who's She's flying. Uh, God bless her. Safe travels. At the son cosa that we we look at as to our future. And thank you, Jorge. Thank you, uh, Reverend Rodriguez. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you, Chantel, for what you do and keep on doing because you are part of our 
heritage. Thank you again. Thank you all. Remember, as Hispanics, we need to, we are, we are naturally loud. So be loud, be proud, but be kind. Thank you, everyone. And do we have any questions? Uh, uh, Kathy, Christian, do we have any questions before we leave? Well, I guess we don't. So thank you, everyone. Good night. God bless. And viva, viva the Latinas. Viva <laughs> Latinas. We'll see you in that Bye. museum. Bye-bye. You are watching the Florida Channel, connecting Florida. Let's face it, social media is an ever-growing part of our world, changing how we connect and how we engage. That's why the Florida Channel also shares programming content through social media platforms like Facebook and Twitter, connecting users with what's going on in state government and engaging viewers with visual and meaningful content that you can't find anywhere else. So find out for yourself if you haven't already. Follow and like us. The Florida Channel, connecting Florida for more than 20 years. Environment, Agriculture, and Flooding Subcommittee will now come to order. Lexi, please call the roll. Chair Buchanan. Here. Vice Chair Cheney. Here. Democratic Ranking Member Alexander. Democratic Ranking Member Alexander. Representatives Brannon. Representative Brannon. Here. Posada Cabrera. Here. Daly. Daly. Diamond. Here. Fine. Fine. Hardy excused. Hunchofsky. Here. Lamarca excused. McFarland. Here. Mello. Here. Mooney. Here. Umfroy. Representative Umfroy. Overdorf. Representative Overdorf. Tomko. Here. True now. Here. We have a quorum chair. Thank you, Lexi. Um, announcements, members. Please make sure you remember to turn off or move your cell phone and/or electronic device to silent. Good afternoon, members, and welcome to the Environment, Agriculture, and Flooding Subcommittee, Week Two. Before I begin, I'd like to introduce. Lexi Rando, who will be our new administrative assistant. Welcome. Beautiful name. Um, members, today we actually, we're gonna have two presentations and we'll, the Department of Environmental Protection with um, Deputy Secretary John Truitt of Regulatory Programs. For the first presentation, we're gonna hear a little bit more about the implementation of the Clean Waterways Act and um, I think a lot of us are looking forward to hearing more about that. After each presentation, what we're gonna do is we'll take some Q&A from members. So without further ado, um, Mr. De Deputy Secretary, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair. Uh, members, appreciate the opportunity to be here today. So I will jump right into this. So as we remember, Senate Bill 712 or the Clean Waterways Act, was actually probably one of the most comprehensive water quality bills the state has seen in years. Um, it focused on improving existing, a lot of existing systems such as septic and stormwater, wastewater, and it also touched on agricultural best management practices. Um, the main highlights we have up there, so we had increased contingency plans for power outages, because when you look at um, storms in the state of Florida and you look at sanitary sewer overflows, usually in the neighborhood of 60 to 70 percent of them are due to power outages and or power outages from flooding. Um, 
It also includes provision of financial records for those disposal systems so we can ensure that they're being appropriately um, cap expenditures moving forward. Uh, detailed documentation of fertilizer use by ag operations and corresponding enforcement.